ready to get started. And let's give it up to Wayne again. Thank you, Wayne. The rest of them are still eating, huh? <laughs> Did uh, anybody have any questions we were going to pick up after the break? Anybody remember a question you had or a comment or something you wanted to make? Observation? You already asked? Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Yeah, but you so kept us out of your asking. Oh. It was good. It was probably the best question I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and she got every book I brought, so I already got it. It worked. It worked. I need to say more. You can hold on to the letters and speak into the microphone too. Let's go ahead and put that slide up too. We were on last time. George, you have your chance. Yeah. Hi, again. How are you? Good. Thank you, you moved. I did. Most people don't move after. They always sit in the same it seat. It's really so. cold there. I, oh, it's cold over there. Yeah. <laughs> Had a good reason to move. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you when you were growing up, did you, what was your like church setting like in your relationship with God like? Or when you became saved, was it, did you believe in the love of God? Like, did you believe that God loved you? Or, or did you grow up in a very like strict legalistic church community? I didn't grow up in a strictly legalistic church, but I did grow up among a group of folks that God loved us when we earned it. So when we were good enough, and then you know no one's good enough, but as long as I'm better than most of you, like hopefully God grades on the curve, because none of us is perfect, so I'm better than you, I'm, then you're my competitors, right? So No, it was like almost everything we're a part of is kind of a mixed bag. Was God really in that? Yes. Did God make himself known to me in ways that made me hungry to know him? Yes. The only tools I was given to explore that relationship, though, were religious tools. So it was more work. And then if I, God disappoints me in some way or God doesn't come through in a way, then I've got to try harder and work more. And then it gets, I get further and further distant in all that working. So that's 42 years of my life of this moments of God making himself known, Wayne trying to earn more of it, it getting lost, Wayne having to find his way back to it. And... It wasn't until 42 where the trajectory of knowing that I had the Father's affection because I was his creation. You know, I'm the beloved son of a gracious Father, even at my worst. I'm still that beloved son. You are a beloved daughter of a gracious Father. That's all the identity I need. That's all everything I need. And if I live in that reality, then I get to fly a little bit on the wind of the Spirit here. And if I don't live there, then I get lost. But I didn't have a strict legalistic background, though there's something a bit legalistic in all of us, even if we didn't get it from church. There's something about our flesh that wants to earn God's reality. And then, or if we can't earn it, wants to punish us. And then the worst part is when we think that it's God doing that. It's God punishing us. And then, then we really, we get stuck pretty quick, right? Okay. Anybody else? So who's punishing us if it's not God? Sorry? Who is punishing us if it's not God? Well, the enemy punishes us, sin punishes us, we punish ourselves, thinking it's God. So, yeah, I just don't look at God as being the source of that punishment, because God's the love in the world. God, God knows it's tough to find us here and win us out of that. This is a big deal, right? Because we, we believe lots of lies about ourselves, we believe lots of lies about him, we believe lots of lies about the world, we try and make it on our own, do our best, we give up and just indulge ourselves in sin that even twists that knot up even tighter and then we get into a religion thing where hey we're forgiven is all good but then they start twisting it tighter because now we've got to perform for God to love us and it's just so exhausting just talking about it right it's exhausting that's that's what I want you to see when you see those blue lines going downward man that's just weight exhaustion performance work never good enough never enough I just want you to feel all that weight because then you'll want to get out of it, which I'm going to show you. I told you to come back and show you how to get out of that. If you find yourself stuck in the weeds. That's, that's what this is, stuck in the weeds. I'm doing lots of learning. I've learned new stuff, but it's not working. It's not setting me free. That's what I want to get to. Is there anything else before we go there? Uh, yeah. Um, April Sanders, online, Zoom says, do you relate with each person of the Trinity differently? <laughs> do I relate to each person in the Trinity differently? Differently. Yes. Boy, that's really tough to do. Um, I, I guess the easy answer would be no.
because I, just like if you were with Sarah and me, would you be relating to Sarah differently than you would relate to me? No, I'd just be who you are. Sarah and I might perceive it differently. If you were just with Sarah, if you were just with me, maybe you would say things to Sarah you might not say to me, or vice versa. Uh, but the Trinity's always there. I can't talk to Jesus without the Father listening in, right? Yeah. But the Spirit, so there's that community there, and we get to be in it. Are there things that Scripture encourages towards? So if I'm asking for something, Jesus told me to ask the Father. So if I'm asking for something, I'm asking the Father. Uh, the Spirit is the one that makes that real. So if I need guidance, I'm asking the Spirit to guide me. Now, if I ask Jesus to guide me, is the Holy Spirit going to be mad? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no. But I like when I'm, when I'm talking, when I'm praying. I, I like having a, a thought in my head as to who I'm talking to. And maybe that's what April's asking. I may be talking to the Father. Sometimes I might be talking to Jesus and just really thank you for rescuing me. Thanks for being my friend, my older brother, who walks me through life and has got my back no matter what. I, I might be talking to him about stuff. And I might be talking to the Holy Spirit about stuff. And uh, I think at times I'll say, you know, God kind of said that, or Jesus kind of said that. It's like the Holy Spirit kind of showed me something. So. Um. I have two questions. So my first question. I thought I answered your question. Though. You did, but I have two more. Pay attention to these answers, then you'll buy books. <laughs> so, my first question is like, how I find myself not wanting to read the word, and it's because of how I grew up with. It just like tells you what to do, and it's mm -hmm. rules, and I can never meet the standard, so then I feel condemned. So how did you bring yourself? to like fall in love with the word again. And my my second question is, um, you know, with all this love, you know, I just feel like people get like willy nilly like, oh, God loves me. I'm gonna go sleep with a dog or I'm gonna go touch a child and God will sleep love me anyway. Dog. Like basically you people wanna do whatever they wanna do. Yeah and just do it in the name of love. Like, I'll still be loved, I'm still accepted. So, wh where do you draw the line, you know? Because I feel like that's like new AG. Like, you can do whatever you feel. Like, do you draw the line with just go back to the word? You okay. know? <clears throat> yeah, I think I got it. Let me, just, let me say this, the word is never the book. Uh -huh. yeah, it so yeah, that's we right. call the book the word of God, and we've been doing that for a long time, but the Word calls Jesus the Word. And the book calls Jesus the Word. Right? right? He's the Word made flesh. And we talk about the, the, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's Hebrews 4. It's not talking about the book. It's talking about Jesus in me, revealing the Father. Can you say that two times and say it louder? Two times louder? Yeah. All right, listen up! No. No, I need it. I do need you to no, say but, it. No, but Desma... When you say you love the word, just cakes for my wife. Yeah, don't you bring cake in here at me like that. <laughs> no, you know, that's not right. <laughs> what is that? You know, it's funny because earlier Wayne said it, and I heard uh, Jamie say it recently. It's, in Matthew it says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who's going to reveal the truth. Jesus said that. He didn't say I'm going to send you the word to reveal the truth. Because he is the word. He is the word. And, and, so and I, why get, I get confused. Well, why that's important is because if we're following the word and we think it's the book, then we're following, we're following an interpretation. And everybody who teaches scripture has an interpretation. Some are good interpretations. Some are wrong interpretations. So you don't want to be following the book. You want to be following the word of Christ, the living Christ revealing himself in us, right? The book is the truth, small t, about the truth, capital T. Ooh, and Jesus good. is the truth, the capital T truth, Jesus. So I want to be inside him. If not, I'm going to use the book. I'm going to use the book to beat me over the head and make me feel guilty. I'm going to use the book to justify whatever it is I want to do. And what you just said about love, people say, oh, do you love me? It doesn't matter what I do. People who say, do you love me? It doesn't matter what I do, have no idea what love is. They see love as something that just... Is, is empty. To love Jesus is to want to be like him. No, to love is want to lay down your life. You sacrifice and you do. That's love. 
Jesus said, there's no greater love than the one who laid out his life. He didn't mean die. It means, so, so when you want to have sex with a dog, what? Oh. or whatever else you said. She said she's going to just sleep with the dog. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah sleeps with our dog a lot. She yeah. sleeps on the floor. <laughs> like that's not, I don't know what she means. We just want to have, my dog sleeps in our bed. I'm there you go. Off. That's okay. <laughs> no, the thing is that, you know, because and these are great conversations because I have these conversations with myself all the time for the last 30 years. And Wade's been having it for, with himself for, I don't know how long, Still having it. Oh, still having it. No, no, I'm still having it, too. The, the point about living love inside this love and beginning to believe what's true, if, if my belief in the love of God is I can do whatever I want and it doesn't matter, you're right in the sense that God will love you even when you're doing stupid stuff. That's true. But am I benefiting from that love? The Father's loving the prodigal even when he's out wasting his money on bad things. He's still loved. But that love is doing him no good because it's not love that's changing him and inviting him into a different way of living. So, like I said earlier today, if the Bible is not a, a, a book that opens your heart to see God and his wisdom, don't worry about it. If, it's, if you read it with the angry voice of the pulpit guys condemning you, then don't read it. But Jesus will invite you in someday because there's so much rich treasure in there. So how do you fall in love with it again? I, I've never stopped reading Scripture. I, scripture's always been a gift to me. But I don't interpret it the way a lot of people interpret it. I don't interpret Scripture religiously. There's things in Scripture that I think a lot of Christians have wrong. They can quote you a verse, but they're still wrong about what they're saying that verse means. So... I read scripture in a way that endears my heart to Jesus, that makes me want to be more like him. I, I read things where I fall short in the scripture, and I don't sit there and oh, what a horrible person. I've been a Christian for 68 years. I had to be better than this. I read and say, Jesus, man, I want to see you do that in my life. I want you untangling that mess so I can live in this freedom, and I'm not trying to do it myself. I'm not trying to obey the scriptures. I'm trying to follow Jesus. And Jesus, of all the truth that can happen in the world, Jesus knows what I need to see today to invite me more into that glory. And it's not everything, right? That's why when we sometimes try to help people, churches do this, pastors do this, following up discipleship, counselors sometimes do this. Somebody comes new to Christ. Here's all the things you need to know to walk in Jesus. And all Jesus has is, I've got one thing to show you today. It's going to help you look here. As we live that, now I've got another thing to show you. Now, and so we're just giving people curriculum here. We're not always helping them. It's like Paul said, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge, a knowing of what's true. So when we get involved in saying our Christian growth is learning more facts about God, it won't work. Unless those facts about God are helping you see him as he's leaning into your life and experience. And that's what Jesus is always doing, man. He's leaning into your life. And you can invite it in. You can push back on him. You can do lots of things. But he just says, I, and he wants us to live free for us. Religion turned it all around. Like God hates you until you get some things right in your life, right? So we're trying to change and not be sinful and do, for him because it makes him angry or it makes him upset at us or it makes him want to punish us or withhold his blessings and that's not who God is he wants to invite us here not for him for us I want you to be free I want you to know my glory I want you to be in that circumstance where people are attacking you and stuff but you have my peace because you have my insight you know what's true here they don't know what's true so it doesn't matter what they do to you it doesn't matter whether nailing you to a cross or stoning you or just lying about you, it doesn't matter. Because in him, I'm learning what's true and what's not true. And what's not true doesn't bother me so much anymore. Now, people in the shack came out and accused Paul and I and Brad of, of writing a book to indoctrinate Western Christianity into a black Madonna Hindu cult. Oh my gosh. What the tar is that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what a black Madonna Hindu cult is. I just didn't like Jesus the way, or didn't like Papa in the, in the book. It just, 
you know? And what they say doesn't matter. When you draw your identity from who God is and who he is in you, Jesus often says that about him. Jesus knowing where he came from and knowing where he was going. No, he didn't, people didn't like him, people tried to kill him. He knew who he came from and where he was going. He was settled in the heart of the Father. He could negotiate the anguish and brutality of other people because he was following God. Doing what I see the Father doing every day. Saying the things I hear the Father say. That's how Jesus lived his life. He didn't come down here with a systematic theology about God going to help us understand it. He just, today I'm going to do what the Father shows me to do. Tomorrow I'm going to do it. Now he's offered to do that for us. And we replace that with a book that we interpret to a bunch of rules and then we meet those expectations. And that's what I want to go away from our hearts saying, I serve God by serving the rules. And I'm going to say, no, you don't. You're just serving yourself. You're either serving your guilt, you're serving your desire to be significant and important. And so you're using the book to, remember what I said about this third line here is rationalizing to self-preference. That's religion. I'm rationalizing God's things. There's a lot of truth in Christianity. They have a lot of truth, small t, but they've left out how to live it because they're trying to perform. And hoping this performing will eventually lead me here, but it doesn't. It leads me here. Now, how do we get back? I'm stuck in the weeds, Wayne. Learned a lot of stuff. Even more stuff about love, but I just feel like God's not making himself known to me. I feel this frustration, fear, and anxiety. Here's what I do, man. When I'm in my bed at night, awake at 3 a.m., anxious over something coming my way or something going on in my life, I realize I'm not living here. At least this part of me. There's other parts living here. In this area, though, it's not. Do you know what I'm praying? I'm laying in bed saying, Father, what is it about your love that if I knew it, I wouldn't be anxious here? What is it about the circumstance, I don't know, that if I knew it, I would be at peace here? What is it about the way you're going to work here that I can't see yet, that if I knew it, I would be at peace here? And I just hold that before God. I'm going to give you a great word. You can put it right... Uh, hmm. Somewhere down in here, okay? I don't have a circle for it, but this is what I do now. When I think I'm hearing something from Jesus, I ponder it. Ponder is a great word. Because if you're not pondering, you're plotting. You get, you get a little glimpse of something Jesus-y, and you don't ponder it until Jesus makes it real in you, you try to go off and do it on your own, you'll be plotting. And we're infant, almost every ministry on the planet was begun out of plotting. Because Jesus shows us something. Shoot, Mary, this is where I get it from. Get it from Mary. Angel shows up. You're going to get pregnant having never known a man. Well, that's a day's worth of information. And I don't even know what she knows. I'm, what am I going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? I don't think. You know, we had Mary said, oh, that's great, God. Awesome. I'm in. She just said, well, whatever you want, may it be in me according to your word. Then she goes to hang out with Elizabeth, her cousin. And Elizabeth gives her this outrageous prophecy about the son she's about to bear. <laughs> what does Mary do? Ponders. She pondered all these things. She just held them. I don't know what that means. And I can't fulfill it without him. I, I can't get pregnant on my own. So if that's going to happen, God's going to have to do something that he's never, ever done in the history of the world. But that's, that's where Mary ponders. All this stuff about Jesus and what he's going to do to redeem the world and how he's going to be hurt and crunched by the evil in the world, she ponders it. She just holds it there. That's what I do. And I hold people there. I hold people that I know that I care about that are lost in the weeds or attacking me or lying about me. Or I just ponder them to God. I, that's bad use of the word, but I like it. I just ponder them before God. I just hold them there. God, I just hold, you, you know. You love them. You want to break through in their life. And I don't know how you do that. I'm just holding them there. And I ponder thoughts God gives me. And I ponder them for days and weeks until something clearer comes. When clarity comes. Or when, certain, when Mary's pregnant, now she's got something beyond pondering. To, okay, now what? What am I supposed to do with this child? Get it? I love that. So, yes, sir. Um, you know, Mike? So, no. I just love, no, I love Mike. I'll repeat it. No, the thing is, that's a very important thing that you, because I think many of us, again, I know people in the room, we don't ponder. No. We just... We try to fix things. Right. Yeah. We yeah. try to do things. 
We're always doing something. Yeah, we don't ponder people because we're right. trying to fix them. Right. Or get them out of our life or right. make some reaction to or them. give them answers. Yeah. And the answers to hear from God. Yes. But they don't know what to take. We don't know how to hear from God. So when I'm talking to somebody who's struggling with this journey, one of the things I'm doing is not saying, what are all the things they need to know? We're doing that kind of today in a teaching thing. I'm throwing a whole lot at you. Like, well, I'll never remember this stuff. And you won't. So the Holy Spirit calls some stuff back to your side. I'm trying to give you a big picture so Holy Spirit's got room to work inside here and show you stuff, right? But I'm sitting with somebody and they're sharing. I'm listening for what I think God's already saying to them that they may not be hearing yet. Or they, they might be hearing it but not hearing it. There's a real funny outtake on the Shack movie when Octavia Spencer's sitting on a bench and Max coming in yelling at God for killing his daughter and and he said, what do you mean, Mac? I wouldn't kill you. You, you are that wrathful God. You like to kill people. And you can see in the background, a motorboat with a water skier comes across the lake behind Octavia Spencer. And she hears it, but it doesn't register if the take is ruined. And so the, the Mac character is like, look, that guy in the pool right there, but she's going to kill him. And it's just hilarious because sometimes we hear it, but don't hear it. I think that's true of a lot of people. They're hearing God, but they don't hear it because... Yeah. They might be excusing it, they might be just arguing about it, or they might just be afraid to put their finger on it. I had a guy recently sit down with me and he's had a big problem in his life and he's telling me all about it and what the options are and why none of the options are any good. And he's, he's saying, what do you think I should do? And I just chapped him on the chest. I said, I think you already know. So he said, what? He said, you already know. He said, what do you mean I already know? I said, I think you already know. You just don't want to do it. You want me to give you something else so you can blame me. I think you know. And he looked at me and said, you're right, I do know. Well, there we go. I don't think God makes it that hard for us to see. I think we make it hard for us to see because we don't like truth when it pokes a hole in our illusions. We want to get the duct tape out. Yeah. Um. What about when we're pondering something or processing something and um, all the stuff like the fears and the anxiety mm -hmm. and all that stuff, like you're so tangled in it that it gets in the way of you, like yeah. pondering, I guess. Yeah, that's this right here. That's this word right here. When I find myself stuck in the weeds, <laughs> you know, I just feel stuck. I just feel like... <laughs> going on back here. People, I'm very nervous about people behind me today. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> How do I find myself just able to get back here? Yes, I'm a flawed being. Yes, I got stuff in here, but I've got Jesus who's revealing the Father to me. And I've got stuck here and something I don't know what to do. It's got too convoluted to whatever. This is the word I want you to put right here and then just hold it because I know the word will tick you off because we've been taught it poorly. But the word is repent. And the word repent is not, here's how most of us have learned repent. Oh God, I'm such a rough person. I'm laying in the middle of the night, you're such a wage, and I don't trust you in nothing. That's not repentance. And I promise never to do it again. That's not repentance. But, but that's what everyone thinks repentance is. It is. You know, what, you know what that is? You know what I just described to you? It's not repentance. It's groveling in our shame. And groveling in our shame will not change you. Groveling in shame will take you to a dark place, it'll make you perform even harder. You will fail even more. You'll grovel more. And it just goes on and on. Just, here's repentance. It's a simple. I already talked about it a little bit earlier today. But if I'm, in, if I'm feeling futile, I'm just nothing matters. It doesn't count anymore. I'll just say something like this. Father, what is it about your presence in my life that I'm missing? That if I saw it, I would feel purposeless here. What is it about your love I don't know that if I knew it, I wouldn't be anxious here? That's what I pray in the middle of the night when I'm awake. God, there's something I'm missing, either about what you're saying to me, and that's repentance. I'm missing something you're sharing with me, and I don't want to miss it anymore. Do you hear any <coughs> performance in that? Do you hear any shame in that? Like, I'm a bad guy for being anxious. I don't feel bad about being anxious. I'm a mess. I've got all this stuff going on in here, and I can't sort that out. So when I get lost in the stuff, any of you play golf? <laughs> Herbal Mulligan? Hit the ball out in the weeds. You go out there and try to hit in the weeds. You can't. Take it back. I'll start over again. Mulligan, just forget it. Now, it's not really fair in golf if you're competing. 
But man, a mulligan is a great gift in life. Wayne, I'm just lost. I don't know what to do. Start over. Wake up tomorrow and just say, Jesus, I want to start fresh with you. Some of you got lost in the weeds. Some of what you've learned is good. Some of what you learned was a little twisted. You got confused of what's real, not real. Let's start over. And say, would you show what do you what do you want to show me today, Jesus? I want to lean into that space. Next day, what do you want to show me? I mean, it be anything. You may not see anything, hear anything. Just ponder. Just hold it. Until clarity begins to come. And it will. And in the meantime, the repentance part is just simply, and I'm missing something, Jesus, and I don't want to miss this anymore. Will you help me? How do I know that? The word repent and believe is the invitation Jesus gave, right? The kingdom of heaven has come near. Mm. Repent and believe. Yeah. In a religious construct, what does repent and believe mean? Well, it, repent means grovel in your sin. So, really, or shame. I'm really sorry, God. I promise as change of mind. That's how we pull that out of repentance. So it means I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to do better. You've already hopped into the land of performance. Right? Just trying to repent. You've hopped back in there. It's going to fail you. Yeah. Repent is not, I promise never to do, because then when you do, now you've got to double the sorrow. Right? So, and then believe means... Creedal. I believe Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. So if I repent, I'm sorry for my sins and I promise to do better, and I believe that you're Jesus, that's, there's no life in that. <clears throat> repent and believe was not a religious word when Jesus used it. We don't hear it anywhere else but in religious things, right? No one talks about repenting and believing at work. But in the, it, when J Josephus, the Jewish historian, is writing Roman history, he talks about two generals that come on a battlefield where a third Roman legion is being defeated in battle by insurgents. And the two generals come on the field and one says, hey, listen, I'll put my forces over here and we'll do this. And you put your forces over there and you do that. We'll help them win. And the one other general says, no, 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 I got a better idea. Why don't you deploy your forces like this and I'll deploy my forces like that. And that'll be better. And the guy says, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm right. Here's a better way to go. And then they're arguing while their countrymen are dying down there. And one of the generals turns to the other and says, repent and believe. Does he mean be sorry for your sins and believe Jesus Christ, Son of God? It doesn't mean that. What he means is, abandon your agenda and embrace mine. Wow. So when Jesus says, look, I'm bringing a whole new kingdom. You could put kingdom of God up here. I'm bringing you a whole new kingdom. So repent, abandon your agenda. What do you want for your life? What do you think you need to cope with life? What do you, what do you want to be true? What, as long as you're seeking an agenda, you'll miss his. As long as you're seeking to have a ministry, seeking to have importance, seeking for people to want to think you significant, all of that agenda stuff, you just have to realize, oh God, I'm going to abandon my agenda. Whatever you want for me, whenever, however, in whatever time frame, that's repentance. Repent and believe. Make sense? Yeah. That routes all of this backwards. That, that allows, because this, the longer we stew in this stuff, the more desensitized we become to what Jesus might be wanting to show us. Because when you get used to ignoring him, you'll ignore him. When you run from what he invites you to, you, you'll less see what he invites you to. And the reason we do all this, honestly, is because we don't know we're loved. God says, wait, I have more to teach you if you walk away than if you stay. If I know he loves me, that's the best invitation in the world. He wouldn't say that to me just to torment me. He's not saying that to me just because he wants to make my life more miserable. He's saying, here's life. Well, I'm giving you life. So when I know he loves me, obedience or following or believing is pretty easy. When I don't know he loves me, then I've got to protect myself. I've got to sort things out. I've got, oh, hit a button here. My bad, dude. There you go. <laughs> and so the more we learn that we're loved, the more sensitive we'll be to follow what he shows us because he, we know he has all the best stuff and we'll mistrust our own agenda. Now, I've got this other little, little hook thing right here because sometimes we, we, we hear what God's teaching us. Just take it back to something like, I love you, Wayne. And there's part of me that wants to argue with that. Like, how can you love me? I'm a bit of a trashy dude. I'm still 68, not perfect. And, you know, you can find ways to discount that. Why don't you say, okay, man, I'm buying that. You love. And then I start to believe that. And 
start to go here. But then I've got stuff challenging me that I need to deal with. This little line right here is, I believed it, I saw it, but I got distracted from it. Mm. It's the parable of the sower. It's the worries of this life. How many times has that happened? God's showing you something, it seems really neat, but you know, stuff's really going bad at work, and this and I just need to get back in my life on my own terms, try and survive. So this happens too. Now, all of this is to invite us into this space right here. And I didn't share all this to go, uh, it's all bad, everybody's bad out there. Stop I'm just saying, when you get here in the weeds and you realize you're stuck in the weeds, just say, oh my God, Jesus, what is it about you I'm missing if I knew it? And then look for what he's showing you in your own heart and life. If you read the scriptures, maybe you've got a, a really good book to read. Uh, maybe you've got somebody you listen to that helps invite your heart to Jesus. Maybe there's some Christian music or any kind of music that invites your heart into that more spacious place. That's all good. Just enter into that, right? enter into that life. And then as that love becomes real, what he shows you becomes easier to process and deal with, and people help me. And then when I believe it. Someone said this to me one time. It was a young woman, medical student in New Zealand. And I just spent three days with her and a bunch of her friends, and they asked me every conceivable question. These were young kids who had not grown up in a normal religious environment, but they were hungry for Jesus. And they kept asking me questions, asking me questions. I mean, till late at night, early in the morning, they're all living in the same place, so they're all showing up in my face as soon as I wake up, and they're there until I go to bed at night. And they're asking questions, 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 questions. Question. Sunday, two of those are driving me the two hours back to the airport. She's one of those two. And we're driving, they're driving back to the airport because she's got to fly out back to her medical school as well. And we're getting within a couple of kilometers of the airport. And she said, you know what I'm beginning to think, Wayne? Listen to this. It's the only thing you hear today. It would be a day worth well spent. You go home at the break. Here's what she said to me. I'm beginning to wonder if the reason this seems so difficult is because it's easier than we dare to believe. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> That's, a, that's the best observation I've heard in my whole life. I love that. It is easier than we dare to believe. And our struggle with it is not because God's made it difficult. It's because we trust our agenda, our perspective, but I think I need more than I trust what he wants to show me and lead me into. Make sense? Okay. Next slide. Let's have fun with this. And I left something off this sheet. My bad. <laughs> we'll get it added somewhere. I, the reason I take this, excuse me, this line up in here and kind of swirl it around a little bit is to, that we just learn to live inside the train. Do I believe him? When Jesus said, if you love me, no, that's not what I want. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Right? Remember that? Which sounds like, you know, like really creepy. You know, if I said that to you, you know, lucky you can be my friend if you do whatever I tell you. <laughs> There's a little creepy feel to that, right? Like, I'm going to use you in some way. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm already your friend. Friend lays down, a man lays down his life for me. I'm already your friend. You are my friend when you listen. The listening doesn't make me more endeared to Jesus. It doesn't make Jesus more endeared to me. My listening makes me more endeared to him. I get to live the benefit of that relationship. So this is just the living inside God's reality. Okay, there's no movement going on here, right? Because at the same time, I'm believing something and it's growing this. I'm also not believing something and doing this, right? You get that. It's not one or the other. Both are going on. So it's not really movement. So in, it's just our awareness of things. So now I'm inside of God. There's three words I want to use here. I wish were on the sheet. And they're not. I meant to put them on there. It's my fault. Not yours. It's mine. Here's the first word. Love. Love. Right? Just put them up here somewhere. Okay? Love. Because believing, how this relationship works is one, we're inside his love. Right? So that love being revealed to me, that's a big part of this. The next thing I want to use the word rest. So we're in love, in his love. We're at rest in his work. Now, I can put for this, if you want to, how do I live here? John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The whole upper room discourse is all about how to live here. 
This is all about answered prayer. You'll ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. This is about loving one another. This is all those things. But it happens as you, in that day you will know that I am in you and you are in me and I am in you. Now I am in the Father's love. Still got lots of twisted wires going on down here, right? I still got this. But I'm inside that love. And as I'm inside that love, he reveals as I process and believe I'm growing in, in his love. I'm going to be wonderfully relaxed in his love. Okay? And then I'm going to be at rest in his work. That's Hebrews 3 and 4. There's a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Israel missed it. Why did they miss it? Because of their disobedience? He says that, Hebrews 3 and 4. But what he also says, the disobedience resulted from their unbelief. So why do I not rest? Because I don't believe. He's done everything for me. If I don't believe he's done everything for me, well, I think I'm supposed to untangle this. I'll work hard to untangle this. And I'll make a bigger mess and blame God for it because I'm going to pray stuff like sometimes we get into this and I'm praying, God, take my anxiety away. The anxiety is letting you know you're in the weeds. Mm -hmm. If God takes your anxiety away, that's just like praying when you put your hand on the stove, oh, Jesus, don't let this hurt. <laughs> Right? You want it to hurt, so you pull your hand off of it. That's the point. So when I get in the weeds, I'm praying, and I've done this a lot. God, take my fear away. And God, what God's saying is, no, I want to invite you here so that your fear goes away. I'm not taking it away. It's there because you don't trust me. Let me teach you how to trust me, and the fear will go away. In that area. Then you may find fear in another area, because I trust God enough to live inside this, and then in your world, this happens. And you go, oh my gosh, I don't feel like I'm trusting God at all because my trust is this big, but now my circumstances are that big. And then we go into, I'm just a horrible believer. No, I just say, okay, Jesus, what about you? Don't I know that if I knew it, I would trust you with this. So every place where you and I are brought to extremity is a place for our love and trust to grow. It's not a reason for condemnation. It's not, I just don't trust him. I'm a lousy believer. No, I just say, oh, I used to. Now in this area, I'm not. So I want that to grow. I want the believing to go. So, in love, at rest, in his work. That goes right to here. If you're not at rest in his ability to do this, you will try and do it. You will not be restful. You'll be exhausted. If I'm at rest in his ability to work with me, and that's what at rest is. At rest is ceasing from your own labors and embracing this. That's, that's, that's so peaceful right there. That's just beautiful stuff. Jesus said it this way. Apart from me, you should fix a lot of stuff that's wrong with you. Is that what Jesus said? Which book? Huh? Which book? Hezekiah. Oh, Hezekiah. Oh, John 14. Remember? What we said? Oh, John 15. Excuse me. Apart from me, you can do. That's just clear, right? So stop trying to do all the stuff that we think we're supposed to do. God helps those that help themselves is not in Scripture. That's Ben Franklin. Ben got that a bit wrong, right? So I'm letting him reveal. I'm believing. So I'm, this, the last one's going to freak you out. Everybody hates this last one. They'll go, oh, that's not possible. In love, at rest, and the last one, here it comes, with play. 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 Not pray. Play. 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 You say, well, wait, where's the, where's the scriptural text for this play thing? Yeah, I'm going to teach you how to play. A good father will teach his kid how to play. A good grandpa teaches his kids how to play. A good grandpa is always playing with his kids. Always playing. How do we get at play? People, people read The Shack, and one of the biggest criticisms we got about it was that God is too playful. Papa's too playful. That can't be God. And I'm going, have you never read the Bible? How playful is this God? How playful with his disciples? The woman who comes and wants healing, and he says, hey, kids don't, uh, uh, the dogs don't get the kids' food from the table. And she said, ah, sometimes the dogs get the scraps. He's going, yeah, I got you. He's playing with us. Funniest things I've ever heard in my life, I've heard from God. God plays, because play is the best way we tangled humans enter into what's true. I play with people a lot when I travel. We're playing just kind of because I want them to relax enough to see a reality bigger than themselves. 
The scriptures for playfulness are all the scriptures about childlikeness. It's being a child. Can you say that again? I don't know. <laughs> Next time I'm going to make you get me a court reporter. So <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're speaking so much truth. I know, I but so many lines. I, get, I get why you want me to do that. Also, if you want to repeat it, I'm all in. The problem is this. I am five sentences down the road from what I just said. Oh, yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, so I don't know what I just said. I probably liked it because I did five sentences ago. So when it came out, there it is. But it's that childlikeness, which is about play. Jesus played with the kids, and it ticked everybody off, pushed them away. I think the reason why people didn't like the playful papa in the shack is because religious leaders are not playful people. They're seriously boring and disgusting. I was when I was one, so I'm not telling off on anybody else. It's just playfulness is just seems, oh, you know. The things of God are more serious than that. Oh my gosh, if God doesn't play in his universe, if we didn't learn play from him, if the reason you, if the reason why we love laughing our heads off with people in just some fun times or with our grandkids, our children, playfulness is the thing that allows truth to find a home in our heart. Playfulness is the thing that allows truth to find a home in our heart. If you're not playing, you're struggling too much. You're struggling in your own head. You're struggling in your own need to perform. Playfulness, if you don't know, I love the question. I don't know how to play. That's where you start. Ask him to show you. That, that'll help. That's the biggest help right there. I would hang out with some playful Christians. And I don't mean Christians who practice Christianity. I just mean people who know how to play. God enjoys playing. Something in our heart. I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. We really do want to write that down. You said play. Like, can you make a little square out of what you just said? Okay. Okay. If you can repeat the playfulness. Yeah, you said right playfulness is what play allows us to find that one in our hearts. In our hearts. Listen to this one. What? what is Say it again. Playfulness allows truth to find a home in our hearts. A home in our hearts. Okay, thank you. Ashley, you've just become my favorite person in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Saved me a lot. Oh, you go, son. That was a good time. Bibi just got jealous, so we got a real problem. Poor jealousy just popped right in there. Look at that. Poor jealousy. I'm just playing. I'm just playing with her. Well, I mean, you were speaking in that direction, so I can see why she heard it. We did. She was better at hearing it because it's my fault again. <laughs> you can play with me all you want. I don't mind playing. I think Jesus just plays in marvelous ways because that's where we're open to truth. Have at it. Um, there's a scripture after he was crucified where the two disciples on the road to Damascus, yeah. right? That whole... Yeah, yeah. That's a big scripture for me because I feel like um, a lot of his nature has been revealed through that scripture. Yeah, it's I'm beautiful. Unpacking it. I love that. I think those seven miles are our lifetime of him walking that journey with us. But one part where I first noticed his playfulness, I was reading this. And it was a part where they got to their house, and it says, I feel, I don't know if it said this, but it's like Jesus pretended or like like he was going to leave or he had somewhere to go. Yeah, he just kept walking. Yeah, he kept walking, and then they're like, aren't you going to come in? He's like, yeah, I'll come in. So I thought that was so funny, because I'm like, that's so cute. You're like, okay, I'll see you guys later. Yeah, right. Like, waiting to be invited, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'll come. <laughs> and I was like, man, I love that about you. Like, you were, like, playing with them, mm. you know? Mm. Um so I, I see it, and I see it more now that I see him this way. Yeah. I see how it's all over the scriptures. I mean, think about the whole seven miles. He's he's Jesus yeah. with them, and they have no idea who he is. And, and then he, he doesn't say anything. He, he breaks bread, and then they finally know who he is, and he's gone. He vanishes. <laughs> he's gone. Man, yeah, exactly. he's really playing harder than I play. Yeah. I like that kind of play. <laughs> Learn the playfulness of God. If, this is where religion will always get dismantled in our life. Religion will not let you play. Yeah. And Jesus will play you out of religious thinking. He will play you out of performance. He will play you out of the lies. Hello, puppy dog. He will play you out of the stuff going on in your heart. Right? Yeah, pups are great for playfulness. Okay? At love, in love, at rest, and with play. Explore that. This is, this is all you need to do. Right? I've just described it. This is what we need to do. Watch for how he's revealing himself. 
process, make sure what I'm seeing is him and not some lie in my heart, some manipulation by some religious dude, some lie of darkness who comes as an angel of light sometimes. So I've got thoughts in my head that look like Jesus for a while until you realize how self-aggrandizing they are. This process always will increase greater humility in your heart, less arrogance, greater generosity, less demanding of other people. Because here's what people know who live in this. Reality is I know about this much of who God is. We see through a glass darkly, Paul says, or a, a, a shaded glass. In other words, no one who's following Jesus will say stuff like, you know what God told me to tell you? They would never do it. Anybody who does that has not a clue who God is, and God's not talking to them. People who've heard something from God to share with you is going to sound like this. Hey, brother, I was thinking about you yesterday. And I had this kind of thought, and I don't know if it's going to help you or not, but here it is. I wouldn't come and say, you know what God told me to tell you? Why? Because now you have to take it or rebel against God. What if I'm wrong? And I see through a glass dimly. So I had a thought about you, and I'm willing to share it. If it's Jesus, he will speak it to you. Maybe not in that moment. Maybe a few days later, you're going, man, I think Wayne shared it. It makes sense to that. I think there's something in there God's doing. Because I realize there's no one here, the best, <laughs> I was four sentences I started there and didn't finish all of it. <laughs> you know, I, I, if we're all a reflection of his glory, I'm about that much of a reflection, about that much of how God reveals himself through Wayne James. Right. You have that much. You have that much. When we get that together, look at how we see him in front of I put my piece next to your piece. We've got a big piece. That's what the body of Christ is. The body of Christ is that peace grows, not because I know everything there is to know about God. No, I'm living in what he's showing me. You're living in what you're showing you, and it's the fullness of him that's revealed to the body. Yeah. Like people ask me about the chart. Where's the church in this chart? I'll tell you this. The church is any person, connection, relationship, collaboration that is encouraging this. And what's not the church is anything encouraging this. Yeah. Even if it has church on the label. Three more hours. You forgot about tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. That's hilarious. No, it's the times. That's rude. Huh? Yeah. No. Let's play. Let's play. You can't believe how much I'll play. If it helps open people to God's reality. I'm always playing. I have my toenails painted pink once in one group of people. Because they needed it. You want to hear it? Yes. You know, we heard it last night. Here, say it. What? I remember you said it last time. Say it. I already told you. Well, I'll tell you again. No, I was going to be with a group of folks that had recently come out of a very legalistic, cultic kind of Christian thing. I mean, old, you know, old stuff, bondage stuff, uh, down the way women dress and what tempts men and just crazy stuff. And I was going to go be with them. And they invited me to come. They were just falling out of it fairly recently. And they'd read, so do you want a church anymore? And he loves me. And they were going, oh my gosh, we want this journey. And we're at the shack. I saw I was in, going to come to Kentucky. He says, could you come to Ohio after that? And I'm going, why? And they kind of told me what was going on. I go, yeah, I'd come up with that. So they picked me up, one guy driving me up there. And I'm telling you what, man, he can't hardly breathe because Wayne Jacobson is in his car. And he's, he's got me on a pedestal that just freaks me out. There's nothing good's going to happen as long as I'm an expert and you're basking in my glory. Nothing good's going to happen. And so I'm fun with them. I'm playing with them, just trying to kind of crawl off that pedestal. I can't get there. I cannot get off that pedestal. And I'm, I'm praying. I'm last two hours of the trip. I'm saying, Jesus, I need something. I don't know what I need. I need something. And I, that's just, I'm pondering it. I need something. And I got nothing. And I'm at his house for dinner. A bunch of people come over, his family, and others have spilled out of this cult. And they're all, it's Wayne Jacobs in the bed. I can see him in the room. I just, like, I'm right here. And I'm not Wayne Jacobs, I'm just Wayne. That's Wayne. most people call me Wayne, right? And um, I can't get off that. And I'm trying, and they're starting to go home, and I'm just saying, Jesus, I've never had this problem before. 
But I'm praying. I'm pondering. Said, Jesus, I need something. I don't know what it's going to do. It's not dry. All my stuff. My quiver's empty. <laughs> and as everybody's leaving, this 20 year old girl comes and sits down beside me on the couch. And she said, Hi, Wayne. And I'd met her earlier, so I was talking to her a little bit. Her birthday is Saturday. She's going to turn 21. So we're talking about that. And I thought she was just kind of getting ready to go goodbye. And she said, At the end, she goes, Can I ask you a favor? I said, yeah, Sure. She said, It's really weird. I said, I'm not promising to say yes, but you can ask me. She said, can I paint your toenails? <laughs> I said, oh my God. I don't know what this is about. My wife's never asked for this. My daughter never asked for this. My granddaughters have not asked for this. I, I said, why would you want to paint my toenails? And she said, well, my uncle Harvey, who's the guy that invited me, the guy's car I was in, his home I'm in. He said, you know, a couple years ago, his brother, my dad, fell asleep in a chair during a football game, barefoot. And we've always joked, you can do anything to these guys, these brothers, and they'll never wake up. So we painted his toenails in the midst of a cult that doesn't allow even the women to paint their toenails. Little girls can play with it, but when they get a certain age, they're going to stop, because now you're just being seductive. Just, oh let me say it again, stupid stuff. So she said they painted his toenails, and he was mortified. He gets up and he's just like, what do you guys, they hid the nail polish remover, they're torturing old dad. He's still a bit caught up in this legalistic stuff, so he is really just freaking out. And Harvey took to making fun of his brother after that. For a few years now, he's making fun of his brother. Girly man and mocking him, things you can't say anymore in the world we live in, but he's, he's giving it to his brother, right? And she said, I need to even things between my dad and his brother. So we get into this conversation, and then she says, uh, she said, so I turned 21 on Saturday. He keeps asking me because she works for Harvey. She works in his store as his girl Friday kind of thing, his office manager. And uh, so she he keeps, he wants to get me something special for my birthday. He keeps asking me, I keep telling him, I want to paint your toenails. He goes, no, man, you never paint my toenails. I need to make things right with my dad. And she goes, no, nope, never. It's never going to happen. And she'd been badgering him for a month. The day before I arrived, they're having this discussion again. It's now Wednesday, and for her birthday, Saturday, he's asking her, come on, I really want to get you something special. Then let me paint your toenails. And goes, no, you're never going to do that. So then she's telling me this story. She says, on Wednesday afternoon, Harvey said this to me. If you can get Wayne Jacobson to let you paint his toenails, you can paint them. Knowing I would never do that. I'm the man on the pedestal, right? Uh, I wouldn't do it. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm playing right here. I, I looked over at Harvey in the kitchen, and he's just looking at me going, no. Yeah. I said, yeah, you get to. Said, really? I said, yeah. So she didn't do it that night. She did it on her birthday. They did Harvey. And she walked out of the room that night. She gave me a hug, and she said, I don't know that I've ever felt more loved. Aww than you letting me get my uncle. And she was crying. So yeah, I'll play. You want to play? I told that story to a woman one night. I was staying in the home of her and her husband. I was speaking the next day at church, and the woman I didn't know was introducing me the next Sunday morning to speak to this group of college kids, and she gets up and says, here's a man who will go to any lengths to uh, incorporate the gospel into his life, including getting his toenails painted. And then she sat down. <laughs> I'm freaking introduction. I've never met these people. I'm not even there. And I don't have time to tell that story. So here we go. And so if you want to ask me, ask me later. That's what I told them. And no one did, so I don't know what they think of me now. <laughs> because of that, and I've been, I've been back there two years later, I was back there, and to a person, people were telling me, everything changed that moment. Because the rumor spread. Like, There's only a few people there when it actually happened. But they were, they were the next day, they were saying, because I was wearing shoes, they're going, are your toenails pink? <laughs> as bright, as pink as they can get. Really. And it just opened up conversations with people. I had one woman sit down with me, beautiful woman, young 40s maybe. She said, when can you tell, explain to me why my body is so disgusting to God? And I said, you've been told this. She said, I have. So you believe that when God looks at you, he's disgusting. Yes, that's why they cover us up like this. I said, no, that's not why they cover up you. That door opened to talk to her in a way that helped her see herself. She really believed that women were disgusting to God. And 
so many other conversations about things having unrelated to do with that, but just about freedom and the gospel and life and Jesus and how he makes himself known. So yeah, I'm into play. Don't bring me a nail polish today. When I, when I had heart surgery a few years later, they sent me, because the guy runs a fruit market, so he sends me a box of apples and nestled in the top of the apples was a box of, it was a bottle of pink <laughs> toenail polish. These people are playing. They know how to play too. We're playing. I love the play in the family of the body of Christ. Seems if we're not playing with each other, we're picking at each other. Seems like we can't love each other well when I think I know God better than you know God. Seems now that I'll get to judge you when you do something I don't like instead of love you. To realize the entangling happens in the midst of love. So if I see something broken in your life, it's not my judgment you need. It's not my condemnation you need. It's not my instruction you need. It's my love you need. Having my love will open your heart in a way to let Jesus reveal something that will help you untangle that. Can you say that again? No, no I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I should be writing all this down. Oh. Let me encourage you to get the recording. <laughs> yeah, she's being recorded. They can hear it later. They can hear it later. Somebody who, uh, who, who, who's really gifted at typing, transcribe it for this man. Give him a transcription of this thing. <laughs> when are we breaking? I would like for you to. Yeah. I would like for you to talk about jealousy because. Talk about what? Jealousy. 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 Being jealous. The statement that you just said. Still, excuse me. I still have not heard the word. Jealousy. 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 Sorry. It's English. I'm old man. I got old man. No, no, no. I have My English bad. with barriers. And I see that. <laughs> so. You said a moment Jealousy. ago that if we're not playing, we're judging, mm -hmm. and I know that's true for me. Mm -hmm. I Live on that. I feel the jealousy with Lucky and um, Ashley. Ashley. I just I just blocked your name. That's how strong it is. And then I just felt that with you, and it is a joke, but there's truth behind that. Why? Because I'm always competing, yeah. and I'm always usually losing because, okay, she has, she knows more in the religion area, and younger, and freer, and trust me, when I compare my insights with her outsides, and, and it doesn't have to be her, it could be anyone, it could be Gigi, I've been jealous of you, you're in the podium, I'm not, I'm not. Um, uh, Giovanna, she's got a husband that totally went on on this journey with her. That's not my story. And, and it's a real thing. It separates me from people. It puts me into a place to isolate. And I'm sorry because you were in the play mode and look how serious I got the whole thing. Oh, I'm going to play with you. Don't worry. Yeah, because I don't know. And when I play, when I actually play, it's like I do it in a way that it comes out wrong. Uh -huh. You get me? It, it's like... Then I feel shame because, like, yeah. let's say one day I did, and I'll give you the example because they know about it. One day, Ashley was there, and I was here in the morning, and then I said, oh, I wish you would marry my son or something like that, and then her boyfriend was there. It was so inappropriate, and I'm like, why the hell do I say that? Why am I so off compared to the other people? So it's almost like With the judge in me say? says, shut up, baby, and this is what you get for playing, you get me? It's, it's almost like I cannot even play in peace because if I am 100% me, it's gonna create a problem because I have no filter. Emotionally, I'm about three, probably. So it's like a little kid that blurs things out without filtering or thinking about it. Mm. And it's like, it's so, it's like play becomes such a work that I'm like, screw that, I'm just gonna isolate and not be with anybody because it's painful to do relationships. Mm. Because of whatever I have outside, you know, like she was telling me today, like there's people usually don't like me, and there's a few that it, when they can see beyond the <laughs> facade, Crush the exterior, exactly. The but tender, I don't even, sweet center. I don't even do it per. It, I don't do it consciously. It's subconscious. Okay. I it, there's a there is a thing in me like you cannot be, and I'm not conscious. It's like. I cannot be me because if I'm me, it creates some other problems and then I have to go and apologize to Ashley and then I feel I apologize to the boy. It's like such a drama. I'm, I'm like, screw that. I, I might as well just not play like because it's, I go from being completely isolated 
mm -hmm. and closed off to the other extreme. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult. So, of course it's So jealousy is a real thing mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. because it separates me from people. I need people. No matter what, I know I need people. I cannot do this deal alone. Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and I isolate, isolate a lot because I feel so inadequate. Even with you when I was talking to you. You know, my thoughts were, like, when we got to the restaurant, it's like, I have to make sure I don't sit next to you because I feel like I burden you the five minutes that I talk to you. You know, there's a side of me that is like, why did I do that? Why, why do I take, if I have five minutes, to give you a snapshot of my whole life to see if you can actually save me? And it, it's just, it creates an expectation of it. It's complicated. I have to shut up. You know what I'm talking about. I understand. Right. And what is, what, is, what is jealousy? I'm sweating. You know, it's almost like I was like, not even sweating. <laughs> you, you, you remember in the shack, how many of you read the shack? Some of you? Okay, remember the shack, that the refrain where Papa says, oh, I'm especially fond of that one. Yes. Yeah. And it kind of, in, in the book, it kind of makes you like, oh man, God's especially fond of some people. I want to be especially fond of me, right? That's, that's what we all want to be. And then you find out that Papa's especially fond of us all. Yeah. That's where jealousy is. Mm. Jealousy is We're part. In simple terms, I don't even get what you're saying. Sorry. Simple, simple. We are all his favorite. She wants simple. Like simple. She wants simple, simple terms. Simple. We're all his favorite. I don't know if she knows what Papa, Papa means. No, no, break it down. Huh. Yeah, what I'm saying is, jealousy uh -huh. is the fruit of not knowing you're loved. Oh. Mm. So where's the fix? Mm. Finding how loved you are. You're not. God's not comparing you to Ashley to. Anybody else know? To me, to Lackey? In fact, Paul said in Corinthians, anytime you're comparing yourselves with yourselves, you'll lack understanding. When you're comparing, you're living in here. You're living down here. When I just say, okay, God, here I am. And if you find yourself trying to play and being inappropriate, has anybody ever done that? Yeah. I have been. I get in some groups. I was riding with a couple, picking up at the airport, older couple, driving out to their house. Conversation lags a little bit. And I kind of like... And so there's an older couple, like 70s, and I said, uh, I said, uh, bet by now you guys are hoping I'm not an axe murderer. Okay. <laughs> it was dead quiet. I went over my head. I didn't even the joke. Uh, uh, they're hoping that I'm not an axe murderer because they're taking me to their house out in the country in the middle of the night. That's it. And... Uh, so I've sat there a minute going, oh boy, how am I going to fix this? This is kind of a mess. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't mind. He said, if I say something inappropriate, you're not even listening to me. Stop playing with the dog. Exactly. Yeah. If you say something appropriate, you say, I have to apologize. I never mind apologizing. Uh, best, I was just about to say this a couple no, I'm really sorry, guys. I was just trying to, you know, lighten it up a bit. I, I wouldn't mind. Before I could do that, after 20 seconds of silence, the little old lady sitting in the passenger side of the car kind of turns her head over her shoulder and she said, I think by now you're hoping we're not. Oh. Yeah, baby, I'm in the right home. I, I, this is going to be just fine. Uh, Touche. Playing with people is a risk. It can go too far, it can be inappropriate. And then you just apologize. You say, hey, I'm just, I meant that fun. I probably didn't come off well. I think that's easy to do. The bigger thing is what you said. There's a jealousy in your heart. I don't measure up. They measure up. I want to be like that. And what you're trying to do is be someone you're not, thinking the someone you're not is better to God than the someone you are. See, the reason I got all this red down here, this is not you. This is what happens when you got twisted. You are beloved of God no matter how much wrapped up garbage you got going on. You're still beloved. And when that becomes real, that's what you're praying. God, I want to see how beloved I am by you so that I can lean into that space. Right? And that comes at work. That's why Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. I want to add one more thing to childhood because I think playfulness is a great thing that child, children are. Children live without care. When I play with my children, my grandchildren, they're not thinking about the next meal and will I have it. They're, they're at rest in the Father's care. Matthew 6 talks a lot about that. That's a great thing. The other thing children have is a sense of innocence. 
even when they're doing bad stuff, they don't feel bad about themselves <laughs> until we teach them to feel bad about yourself. Because look what you just did to your sister. You are one creepy person. <laughs> okay, now, okay, now I feel bad. There's an innocence. If you're going to live this repentance lifestyle I'm talking about, you wake up every morning and let God restore your sense of innocence. Oh, Wayne, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm still done. You don't know what... I don't care. Our innocence doesn't come from our performance. It comes as a gift from Jesus Christ through his work on the cross. We got that the day we got saved. Where we got confused is now that I'm saved, I should be acting better. Right? Instead of, no, I, I wake up, yeah, flawed? Certainly. I know my weaknesses better than any of you. And Sarah knows them even better than me. Because I tend to think some of the things that are weaknesses, I kind of turn them into strengths so I feel better about myself. If I'm ever wanting to understand where God may want me to grow, I'll say, Sarah, Sarah, is there anything God still wanting to do in my life? Sarah goes and pulls out her 100-page document. <laughs> Let me see. I'm a tangled mess. I love what God has untangled in my life at this point. It allows me to live here a lot of the time. But not always. No, not always. Down here and some other stuff, he has not unraveled that yet. That's still there. And I'm tempted to reach over. I can, I can pull that knot clear. And you have no idea if you pull that knot clear what you've done over there. Yeah. I grew up, as I told you, a Pharisee before my Pharisectomy began in 1994. Still going on. Still working on that. Jesus is working on that. I'm not good. You're not good enough to do a Pharisectomy. It's like doing your own heart surgery. You'd be really stupid, right? God's been giving me a pharisectomy over about 27 years or so. We're not done yet. But when it began, the very early days, before they began, actually, I was a good Pharisee. You can put anger into that. Almost every good Pharisee is an angry person. Because I'm working really hard for God, and God's not rewarding it the way I think. Working really hard for God should have put me here. But it didn't working really hard for God to put me here. Whose fault's that? It's his fault. Now, you can't be mad at God. He's got to get out of hell free cards. You don't want to mess with that dude. So the anger comes out with shortness to Sarah, with anger at my children at times. It's beyond what the circumstance might merit. Or picking up your lawnmower and throwing it into the hedge because the 37th time you pulled it to start, it didn't start. Your hand's about to fall off your body and you still can't mow the lawn. They have done that. Right Why? Because I was a, just an angry guy. I prayed God, take away my anger. God. And I, around people like you, if I'm teaching church, whatever, people wouldn't have known me as an angry person. I could be fine there. I could hide it. I could stuff it down, smile, and be. Even if I want to choke you by the throat, I can smile. <laughs> and then that comes out at home where you can't pretend 24 7. You can't. It's going to creep out there. And man, with this, and I begged God to take my anger away. I just, I've read scripture. I've, and I think when I'm hiding it, I'm overcoming it. Which is the lie. I'm stuffing it. It's going to come out later somewhere else. So I, so I have you know three good weeks no anger, and then it really blows up over there somewhere. And then you hide that real quick, so you're fine. When Jesus began to untangle my life, He never once addressed my anger. My anger came from the fact that I thought God wanted me. Well, let me not say it that way. The anger came out because of Wayne's need for significance. I wanted to be special. Scripture memory class in fourth grade, Sunday school, I memorized 137 verses. Second place is 32. I got a new Bible I didn't even need because I already had one, but I have to win. I want to be significant. I think my calling to ministry might have been, I want to be the guy in the pulpit, not the guy in the pew. I've got more to say than that guy. 12, I think, and stuff like that. This guy's boring. Okay? I could do better. Arrogant. Right? So all of that need for significance, and God was disappointing it. My first book went out of print faster than they got it in print. That just didn't sell. Gone. Next. Published another one. It was out of print shortly thereafter. And there's this anger. Like, God, I'm, I'm writing the best stuff out there. And no one even gets to read it. because And I'm, 
I'm angry at him, but I'm not expressing it to him. Because this is not, I wasn't allowed to. Right? So when I get this, I have more to teach you if you walk away than if you stay thing, and I walk away, and my reputation is being destroyed. People are telling my wife they heard I had an affair, which I had not had, or I'd taken money from which I had not done. And my and I asked, I, I'm just praying, saying, God, what are we gonna do about this? Because you asked me to walk away, so I really felt like that was not to go back there and defend myself. But and there was one point I felt like God said, Can you trust your reputation to me? And that sounds really good, right? You my, my you're going to defend me? Man, that's the biggest bully on the planet when you're a religious dude. That's it. Well, go ahead, God, defend it. I had no idea he wanted to kill it. So all these rumors are being spread, and I'm going, hey. There'd be, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? I'd be a few dead people. Tell the story. <laughs> Nothing. Our reputation is dying. My wife is being stopped in stores with rumors. And I'm just inside going nuts, man. I didn't know you wanted to kill it. I wouldn't have trusted you to kill it. And I'd write a letter. Every now and then I'd get so fresh, I'd write a letter to the church to kind of straighten out the story. And I had a good friend I'd read it to, and he said, ah, oh, those things are great therapy. You got to throw that away now, you know. Oh. I said, no, nah, i got to mail this one. Man. No, 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 it's just therapy. Why don't you just throw it away? And I, two years, I waited God out. Two years. He didn't fix anything. Except what he was fixing was Wayne's need for significance. And when that went away, and I can tell you the day that finished, the day, the minute, I woke up early in the morning, I had a new letter to write on my heart because something had happened, a new rumor, and I'm going, I'm fixing it now. And I wrote the best, most humble letter that made me look really good and then really bad. So you know the humble was only in my mind, right? And I wrote this one page, four paragraphs, so clear, clean, people read it. And I read it to my friend, he's going to work. I read it to him, saying, hey, man, that's this letter. He said, you still write letters? Oh, yeah, man, this is the one. This is the one we've been waiting for. So I read it to him, and he goes, man, that is the best chat. I said, yeah, isn't it? He said, you want to throw it away? No, not this time, dude. He said, I really think you ought to throw it away. I really don't think this is going to help you. I said, man, I've thrown all of them away. This is the best one. I mean, I woke up at 3 in the morning. God gave me this. <laughs> That's that rationalizing to self-preference right there. See that? That's rationalizing. Because God was showing me some stuff, and the stuff was in the letter, but now what I'm going to take with that stuff is not die to it. I'm going to ship it out around the body of Christ. And so I start printing labels on the computer, and I'm, I told him, I said, look, I'm going to send this one. I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. I just need the truth out there so I can sleep at night. And I turned to my Bible reading that morning because I got up at 3 a.m. to work on this letter. And so I opened the Bible, and I'm reading Isaiah, and Isaiah is whining at God. How long, O oh Lord? How long are you going to let them lie about me? How long are you going to let the false prophets get away with what they're doing? And why are you doing what you do? And I'm going, yes. This is a great text this morning. Until, until God answers it. And this is in the message. God says, Isaiah says, you notice I don't I spend one ounce of my effort on public relations. I do what I do. How people interpret it, that's part of their story. And I, I shut it immediately. I'm not reading that. It said, I don't want to believe this. I don't want to. I'm ignoring it. I, I did ignore it. I just said, that's it. Put it up. And then I pull up a devotional book I've been reading. It's The Saving Life of Christ by Major Ian Thomas. And it was a bookmark in the middle of a chapter. Man, type A Pharisee Wayne, he never stops in the middle of the chapter. End of the chapter, one a day. But it was in the middle of the chapter. I think, what happened? Ah, remember. Sarah needed me to go fix something. I went and fixed it, came back, forgot, book sat on the desk. So now I'm in the middle of the chapter. This is the next sentence, top left hand of the page where I had the marker. So many, no, it says it. Many of God's people live so bereft of his love that they vacillate between self pity and self boasting never knowing the freedom from the tyranny of other men's opinions. Wow. I read that, I just read that paragraph and I started to weep. I just started crying. Oh my gosh, I have never known freedom from the tyranny of other men's opinions of me. And that includes women too. First in my graduating class, hard worker at everything I've done, or the best pastor in town, the most prolific writer, 
all the stuff I was driven for, all because of Wayne's need for significance, tyrannized what other people thought of me. It wasn't even, it was work for God, but not really. It was work for Wayne. So Wayne would look special to God. That's what it was. I just wept and I just said, God, is this what this last two years has been? Is this what is? You're freeing me from the tyranny of other people's opinions of me. And I knew that it was. Threw the labels away. Put the letter on file. I like reading it now and then to see how arrogant my humility can be. It's quite a show. I've never released it, never will. But uh, it's a good reminder on that. When God unplugged that need for significance, the anger went away. Never touch the anger. That's not a problem. The problem's over here. I would never have been bright enough to know that. When I talk about this God untangling, he knows why you are. The, you think that the sin is the problem. The sin is just the symptom. The problem is somewhere else, you, most likely. The jealousy, the problem is I don't know that I'm loved by God, so I'm competing. She wanted you to say that again. She <laughs> Who did? She did that. She did that. I don't see it. I don't see the person. You want me to say it again? I don't for you. Good. Mess with it all you want to. So when I when I see a thing, that's a long answer to your question. But you know, when we talk about jealousy, you just say, "I don't know how to do this, Jesus." I don't. Thank you for saying that. I was feeling insignificant. You were feeling. <laughs> okay, the seminar is officially over because everybody's playing. Then I just get wiped out. Okay. Now, does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so then if we do this, this is really quickly, and we're going to be done for a break. Uh, one more slide. Let's go to the next one. There should be some more words here. So, yeah. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I've lost control completely of the entire room, so you're going to get a break really quick. Here's the deal. When I learned to live, I wish love, rest, and play were here. When I'm living in love, rest, and play, inside the Trinity, this relationship is growing. As it's growing, it just becomes very natural to follow Him. You don't have to work to follow Him. It's just, I love Him. He's giving me some insight. Now I'm going to follow Him. The fruit of following is my trust in Him grows. Man, when I did you know, walk away instead of stay, I more to teach you. And when God exploded in my heart, things I never knew about hope, it's the whole book of He Loves Me came out of that two-year period. And I just went, man, that just makes me trust God the next time He asked for something different. Look what He did here. My goodness, I mean, here, when I'm less aware of me and my needs and my condemnation and my anger and my significance, I love others differently in the world. I'm in a conversation, not for what I get out of it, but what I can possibly give to someone else or just play and see what God opens up. Loving others becomes difficult. And then, this is what I just want to draw a line around for it. This is selflessness. This is what Scripture calls us to, right? You're not willing to lay down your life and you know sacrifice and all that stuff. If you talk selflessness to someone here as a biblical rule, it will kill you. I want to say that. Because if I'm going to try and live selfless in my own bondage, I'm going to be a doormat for anyone who wants to abuse me to abuse me. When you teach selflessness to an abused wife, you put her in the most dangerous place you can put her. You cannot live selfless. Someone was telling me this right after lunch. You cannot even consider selflessness until you know how deeply loved we are by God. Until you know how precious you are to Him. And you're not being selfless because you're not worth anything. You're being selfless simply because Jesus has asked something of you that you need to give up for him. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, it's the same with addictions, right? It's the same with everything. I, mean, I, could, I could have a million things right, up here. No, but I want to help them. Yeah, no. What, what, is, what is selflessness looks to, to everybody in the room is different. Yes, exactly. Because they'll say, I don't know, I'm not selfish. Right. No, if you, I mean, if you watch porn, you're not selfless. You watch porn, you're not selfish. You're not you're no. selfless. selfless. Selfless, thank you. Right. I was going, okay, I'm really yeah, confused now. Yeah. You guys have a whole ministry going on here, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. I understand the sleeping dogs coming. <laughs> The 
see why you took sleeping with dogs the way y'all did. That's not how I took it. No, I didn't. I didn't. No, a lot of people here act out this stuff, whatever it is, lying, shopping, porn, whatever. And they think that is the problem, and it is a problem, mm. but it's not. No. It's, it's a, a symptom of the problem. problem. Because they don't know they're loud. Yeah. And Paul's in that thing is that um, if you know, your, what is that, uh, the thing about Paul says, am I telling you to go sin more? No, because if you know you are loved, you won't go and sin more. Mm. Paul yeah. said that. No. Yeah. 30 years in the desert. But this, but this I, want, I didn't put this here so we could try and be this way. What I want you to see is if I'm living here, he's untangling this. And I notice myself living this way. I'm not trying to live this way. Don't go on and take, I'm going to try and be selfless. I'm going to try and love others. I'm going to try and grow my trust. All of that's destined to failure. Yes. But don't do that. I'm not, I'm not. If you do the love, rest, and play, you're listening, believing, following, these things will be happening. And then you'll find these things, the glory of God in your life, the purpose of God unfolding, his truth. Being the way you where you get to live in what's true and not what's false. Oh, we're, we're done time wise. One of the really things that I enjoy, like when we were with this people coming out of this cultic group up in Ohio that I told you about earlier that resulted in some very strange behaviors. I went up there because I love being with people who are freshly coming out of some broken religious thing. Because the questions I love that they want to talk about is this what was real about that? Because always, even in cultic stuff, there's something that's real. God's making himself known, and people are following him. But then they get stuck in following him in the rules of the cult. So the big question is, what's real, not real? What's true, not true? That's what Jesus is doing to me every day. He's not directing. We're not talking about revealing. He's not telling me what to do every day. Go here, go do that. Love that person, give money there, do, 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 do. He's just wanting to show me what's true. If I know what's true, what's true is, I have more to teach you if you walk away. You don't have to walk away. I don't know what to do. He's just showing me what's true. And when we believe what's true, that's what transformation takes. We got people now, and I'm not going to choose a side in this argument, so don't get nervous on it. But we got people believing that the vaccine is the Antichrist, and we got people believing it is the rescue of the world. And probably both of those aren't true, if you want to try and pick a side here. But believe me, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. Just because you believe that scripture says that doesn't make it true. When you live around what's true, these things will be growing in your life. These things aren't growing in your life. What you're doing is saying, Jesus, show me. What's next for me? What do I need to see next? Remember, it's not all truth. Don't inundate yourself with all truth. My goodness, it will overwhelm any of us. But Jesus, what are you showing me today that will open up some truth in my heart about the very situation I'm in? About this person in my life, I just like to punch in the face sometimes. <laughs> what are you showing me that's true about this? We'll come back after break and talk more about it. Anyway. Can you do anything before we go? Any? Somebody asked me to talk about my books a little bit. I don't know yes. if it's a good time, but they're on the table out there if you want them. Um, <laughs> these two are the nice way about he loves me and learning to live in season, father's affection. This goes along with that too. It's live, love, free, full. It's the daily devotional to help you enter the space we're talking about there for God to reveal himself to you. These three are why church sucks. Okay? Amen. And I don't mean, careful, careful. I was kidding. Playing. <laughs> This is about the church that Jesus is building, which is not the church that we humans are. There's a church men's and women, women and women, men and women are building in the world. And this is for people who say, what if there really is something more? What if the connections, relationships, encourage a different way of living than what we've often got? There just a whole lot of work, a lot, lot of expense, money. This is so you don't want a church anymore. This is actually the book that inspired the shack. This is a man frustrated in his church experience, who meets someone he thinks might be the Apostle John, still living in the 21st century. Remember when Jesus said to Peter, what if I let John live, God come again? What is that to you? So we just say, what if? What if a first century apostle was running through the body of Christ? Said, That'd be really weird. And then finding church, oh, there we did that. Beyond Sundays is how do we find unity in the body of Christ family between those who do and those who don't go to church in a variety of different ways? 
lives, that it's more important that we are letting God's glory live in us, and how do we share that journey together? So those are the books. They're out there. I don't know what we're selling them for. I have no idea, but um, in my mind, these are around 12 bucks. These are around 17. Can't afford it? Hey, enjoy it. Well, if they read it. Huh? If they read it. If they read it. I love take people Don't take it for coffee table decoration. Yeah, no, yeah, Please don't do that. So if you want to Venmo me some money, you can do that. Wayne J at lifestream.org, which is also my email. Please don't write me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of people write me every day, so just be patient if you write me. Wayne J at lifestream.org. You can Venmo money there if you want to do that. You can give a check to Lifestream Ministries if you want to do that. You can give cash if you want to do that. You can, whatever. That makes sense? Makes sense. That's all i got to say about that. Okay, many times I feel like, like Gigi, that God does things just for me, and I feel like, wow, that was just for me. So when I pick up the book and I'm looking at the 365, and the way I'm going to pick a book is if I like what's inside, right? So I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm with my friend, we're looking at today's message, and, and it says this, Love, however, is the antimatter to law. Law, no, love is more powerful. It can find its way in the depths of human pain and transform people as it lifts them out of human pain and their misery. Then skip a little bit. Into the misery of our world, God speaks his love in the language of grace. Only those who are truly changed by the reality become a light in the world and offer hope to those who are lost in the darkness. And then it has this beautiful verse. Um, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in this love abides in God, and God in him. And that's from 1 John. And I just thought, like, wow, it could have been any message today. And it was just all about abiding in, in God's love. So anyway, um, it's, it's a shameless plug, but this is an awesome book to read every day. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah. Well, we just haven't had the best one today. They're not all that good. So. <laughs> okay, this last hour is for you. Um, go back to the chart we had up there. Giorgio, if you can find it for me. Um, where do you want to play in this chart? Where do you want to think about? What, do you, what are you thinking about now? Just not so much, well, I'm not going to limit it. Anything? Start talking and then you'll get all the questions. <laughs> What's that? You start talking and then you'll get all the questions. <laughs> I know, but I'm going to list, wait for a few questions first. I want to see where you, where it's going to help you to kind of process what part of this chart, what part of your journey. Is it, is it clear? Does it make sense? Yes. Where has it not made sense for any of you? Any of you? Well, Brandon has a, has a part that doesn't make sense for me. But by the way, if you want this chart, I know you've got it, right? So just email her and say, can you send me that? If you want it electronically, I know somebody's taking pictures of it, but if you want it that way. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so it's not on. It's not on, Brandon. No? Test, test, test. test. All right, there you go. check. OK. Uh, so. This is something I have been uh, walking out a little bit. I don't know if it's really a question, but my process. Okay, great. Um, so, quote unquote, big decisions, right? Um, a job. So, for me, I was, the, the question of in this market right now, um, if you're going to get a new job, this would be the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, because of whatever reasons. Um, so for me, uh, being what I'm doing in my life, uh, there has been, I, I'm, uh, I have a career, God, God forbid, let, let me rewind, I go, to, I go to work for somebody else to do this job that I went to school for, mm -hmm. right, that I had passions about and all this other stuff, but it got morphed into a job, mm -hmm. uh, and that's another journey. So. Um, so right now, it's there's enough. I, I can go to a new job. 
and there's been stress on is it the right time is it just going to a new job to go is it going to a new job for more money is it going to a new job um, and, and I've gone through all these pros and cons of what it does because there's another area in my life where uh, in context where um, because of a trigger uh, of COVID for my family or for myself was I started to pursue personal things uh, like an art. So because of that, I started a, um, my own business, um, doing all this other stuff. So now I have two things and they require a lot of me. So to do a new job, will I feel like it kind of hinders you know, the, the pursuit of art and kind of like what that has entailed, personal goals and things like that for me. So, so the, the, the angst I had was listening to asking God, should I take a new job? And then that process, uh, go through a list of pros and cons and then blah, 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 blah. But I wanted to quote unquote hear from God, be at peace. I haven't I, I put a step forward, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to submit this to other big decisions we all may make and how I process through them because the implications are whatever. So, um, you know, listening to God, but I am, I am sitting on it. Um, I haven't made a decision to do it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've had conversations with like Lockie and other people where it's like, is this where God wants me here in this position, or does he want me over there? Or can you be you in anywhere, in any situation that you go that God kind of wants? So I don't know if there's a question in there, but that, that's kind of like the, the, the process I'm going through. Like, I want to hear God. Am I hearing from God? Sitting down and thinking about it, doing my natural thing of pros and cons and choosing or whatnot, but at the same time, uh, understanding the language in which he has spoken to me in the past um, you know so th these are you know I'm a thinker so I just I yeah. think these things and I think I overthink these things mm -hmm. um, and to where they be they don't become playful they don't become joyful they don't become whatever it is you know yeah. so it's a process yeah wow um, big decisions we could talk about that right how do you make these really big ones? It could be the job switch, it can be who am I gonna marry, or who am I gonna marry this person that's asking me to or wants to, or it could be anything. How does God factor into those big decisions? That's a great thing to probably process. And I, I can only, I, I think, just share with you how I process it. And then if you find something of value in it for you and things you're facing, then maybe that's helpful. Um, to me, the most important question I have about any decision I face is where is God here? What, what, where do I think he wants me to be? Um, if I don't sense anything, it seems like a toss-up. And I pray and I hold it before God and I don't have a sense that there's one thing more in my heart than another, then I, I think God's put that in my purview. What, what do you want to do? I'm going with you. Where we go? Take a new job, save the old job, I'm with you. We'll just go on from there. Uh, if he does have something in mind, I feel like that will grow in my heart. Now, what may grow alongside it is the fear of doing something that's out of my comfort zone, right? I don't know if any of these things are, you know, the riskiness of will the income stay, and people mention art in there is kind of a... Art thing is really tough, because I, I deal with a lot of creative people who want to write books or songs or perform or, you know, fine art kinds of things. Man, I don't think I've ever heard Picasso mentioned twice in the same room of people in the same day. It's just amazing. You guys are into Toulouse Lautrec and Picasso. That was hilarious. Anyway, um, in honesty, it's brutal to make a living at art. <laughs> it is. It can happen. God can open the doors. It can happen. I always encourage young artists with lots of passion and vision to say, have a fallback. We all like to live by our art. Not even even a writer of a Christian book. You know how many books you have to have out there to live off that? It's, it, one book doesn't do it. Two books don't do it. Um, same way, I mean, I have so many young people I know move to L.A. to be an actor, Nashville to be a singer, whatever, and 
there's room for a very slim minority of people to get in that space. I always say, hold that very carefully. People want to go into ministry and say, should I go into ministry, should I not? I just say, you know what, if you go into ministry, quote unquote professional ministry, have a backup. Double major or major in something else, minor in literature and ministry. I know a lot of kids today graduating with a pastoral counseling degree, they put a lot of money and time and effort into, and it's tough to get paid for that, right? Or youth leadership, it's tough, except that a lot of youth leaders get burned out, replaced by a whole other set of youth leaders who get burned out, replaced by a whole other set. So even then you need to fall back. It's all part of my decision making. What consequence am I willing to endure in this decision? I got more to teach if you walk away if you stay. For me, that meant no income, reputation destroyed, and I don't know that I'm right. I don't know that I'm right. But I, mean, I can look back now and go, boy, that was the right thing to do. At the time, I'm going, this is just the best I know. And I even prayed, when we left, I even prayed, God, if, if I'm wrong and they're right, and I'm an arrogant, rebellious, independent person, I haven't told God, shout it to the whole city. I don't care. I just want to know. I want to know for me. If I'm wrong, I want to be exposed for being wrong. If I'm following you, I want you to affirm that so I can keep going down that road. So hold them. If, if, it's easier to have two options. I don't know if that's what you're saying. It's two options. So it's just that, where's my heart leaning more? And I would... I wouldn't process that on pros and cons because just on pros and cons alone puts me back down here, right? I'm trying to rationalize to what I think is best. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't just go to pros and cons. So I took like, what, what if I take this and it doesn't work out? What are my options? If I stay here and this doesn't work out, or maybe it works out really well, but I'm unhappy, then what are my options there? And I, I hold it before God. In, and this, this is going to differ for all of us, okay? When I'm holding stuff before God that I finally need to make a decision, I don't mind holding stuff for like a week or two to see if one grows more significant than the other. I'll converse this with my friends. Let them troubleshoot it with me. You know, what are you thinking? Here's where I'm leaning, and I'm pondering that with my friends. And then when it comes down to a decision, I'm just honestly saying, in my heart of hearts, as close as I can be to God, in the sense that I'm going to get into what some people are now calling a thin space. You know what a thin space is? Yeah. Yeah, a thin space is a place where, geographically, where it's easier for you to lean into God's reality. For me, it's a walk in the woods, hands down. For other people, there's a certain chair in their living room, family room, patio, that when they're there, it's not that God's more there than anywhere else, it's just there I'm more receptive. I'll get in a place... I'll go for a long walk for me, or I'll sit in Sarah's garden, and I'll just hold it saying, God, do you have an idea? And I know what most of, I'll say this that may be helpful. I think most of us look for certainty. I want to know which one it is. And I don't think we ever know. If we're going to look through a glass darkly, as Paul said, we, you know, the perfect hasn't come yet. So people ask me, how certain do you have to be it's God? And well, it partly depends. If, if the risk is to both Sarah and me, then we have to be in agreement. I don't travel anywhere in the world for which Sarah hasn't also said, I think this is your trip, this is yours, this is for you to go. Whether she goes or not, that's another decision. But I don't travel until Sarah says, yeah, that's in my heart. Because she could be a victim of that travel. Mm -hmm. If I'm here and some calamity happens at home and Sarah's got to manage it by herself, which she's had to do on occasion, if she's the victim of my travel, resentment will build in. So she's always, I'm, I'm in. This, this trip sounds right. This time to be gone sounds good. Now, if something happens climactic, I may fly home. I may say, you know, I can't stay for tomorrow. I'm flying home, but I promise you this. I'll come back some other Sunday. We can have breakfast and sit around chat. I'll come back. So I, I'm going to go home if I need to. I don't ever feel like I have to finish something because if God needs me there, I want Sarah to know that I will always put her first. So, so if it involves her, so if I'm married, I'm making job decisions, I want my wife in on it, or my husband in on it, if it goes the other way. Um, and just hold, and I have to be like 51% certain. You know, if I, if I, this is kind of 49%, I can see good things here, maybe this one's a little more on my heart, that's where I'm gonna go. 
And, and I won't make that decision right away. I'll make it. I'll say, okay, I think I'm going to go this way. And then I'll, I'll give that another week. Say, God, if I'm missing you, I'm going this way. This is where I'm going. If I'm missing you, draw my heart out of that. And, or if you can confirm it, confirm it. Sometimes you'll be in a conversation. Somebody will say something exactly like the choice I'm making where I'm going, okay, that looks like God saying, yeah. But also deal with the fact that God may not care. <laughs> Just like if my grandkids are coming over and, and do they want to play trucks? Do they want to uh, play blocks? I don't care. I'm in on either one. Some of our decisions are that way. God made you to make decisions. You're a decision maker. And so some of it's that. Some of it, if there is a will, show me. I'll choose it, hold it. If I feel like he miss, he's redirecting me, I think I got that wrong. I'll redirect. I'll try not to respond to the fear of the unknown. Because I think that kills me. I just don't respond to the fear of the unknown. I'm willing to take the risk if I'm willing to suffer the consequences. So if that means, you know, if I've got more to teach you, walk away and you stay, and if that means, man, that didn't happen and God's not providing and I get a job at Walmart as a greeter, I'll get a job at Walmart as a greeter. Let's do it. And I'll see what else God has next. I don't mind if I get it wrong, and I don't mean wrong like God's upset. I just mean I didn't make the best choice and now I've got a different set of circumstances. Then God's still in that. Does that make sense? The most important thing is that we relax about it. This tension that there's only one will here that, remember that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? And nobody wants the good and acceptable, but the perfect will of God. Well, the perfect will of God is how he's changing you. It's not where you work. It's not where you sleep. It's, not, it's none of those things. It's his changing you. So I think God's, that's why the, the relaxing in his love, resting in his work and at play, if I can bring myself to a place where I often hear him and sit down and cultivate that sense in my heart, then what does it look like is best? And if my friends are good with that, but I've done things, even all my friends just saying, Wayne, this is stupid, don't do it. And I go, I know, I feel the same way, but I still feel like it's God. At the end of the day, I'm not voting with my friends for what I do. At the end of the day, I'm true to my conscience. True to what I feel like. Does that help? And then I pray God just give you with the wisdom you need. Let you know. Give you a comfortable place of peace inside that, even if it's risky. Because uh, some of the best decisions I've made were risky. You make all the safe ones and you end up in places you don't want to really be. So. Yo. Easy. This one is easy. It's what? This is easy. She's going to give you an easy one. I'm going to give you a break. <laughs> a break. I don't need a break. You said something as long as you're not in the whatever fear, the indecision. What, what was the unknown? The unknown. The uncertainty. Did say it. Yeah. Say it. Say it. I don't remember. I'm saying <laughs> well, it somebody you say else. that as long as he's not responding to the fear of the unknown. Oh, okay. Responding to okay, the so fear. Okay, so tell me the about that because I think I live there. Oh yeah, we most all do. So tell, but, but put it in simple terms, please, <laughs> just for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is always fun. I mean, You're too fancy. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think if we want to live in the upper part of this chart, that's where we want to live. In the kingdom of God, in the unfolding work and grace of God in our hearts, I think we have to learn to be comfortable in uncertainty. <laughs> that's my visceral reaction too. Yeah, I hate that. But the problem is, here's what I want us to see. When we're trying to live in the comfort of our certainty, we're living by our own projection of possibilities and what we think is best with limited knowledge and information. That's what it is. So I'm doing what makes me feel comfortable, but just like two years ago when I was here, we have no idea a pandemic's coming, how that would change the world. And... In my own life, I can, I can somewhat determine my responses. I can't always determine the impact of those responses. Stuff comes at me all the time that's not what I was expecting. You too? Yes, that's why it's hard to say, well, you know what, I'm just going to go toward what is most certain. <laughs> then we're going to end up living in our own projected intelligence, which I don't find that much confidence in anymore. <laughs> what I do trust is Jesus saying... Each day has enough grace of its own. Yeah. 
Amen. So today, and I think this whole focus comes down to what is Jesus showing me today? I don't hear anything. No harm, no foul. Move on to tomorrow when I get there. But it unfolds, and yes, that feels horribly uncertain. I get that. And if you're at the very beginning of the trailhead looking down that trail saying, I don't like uncertainty, then you may want to look for a different kingdom. Because what Jesus wants us to become certain about is that you are loved, that I am with you, that you can't make a mistake bigger than me, that I can't even take your mistakes and work them for good. And so my, my certainty is never in circumstances. Now, I won't say never. I slip into that like anybody else. But I'm trying to get my certainty inside of him. My future is certain, not because I'll make all the right decisions or I'll do all but because he is with me. And he's bigger than my mistakes. He's been bigger than my mistakes before. He'll be bigger than them again. You end up on the mission field and maybe think, maybe I jumped the gun here a little bit. And it's like, God's not, you ruined your whole life, you stupid <laughs> fool. It's like, God's not got endless ways to get you where we're going. Like your GPS in your car. You get off the beaten track, and what does it do? It just reroutes you. Do you have to go back to where you were and start all over? No, it's going to reroute you from there into what God has for you, which isn't circumstantial primarily. It's spiritual. It's freedom in the inside that allows me to live in the world differently and love, and that opens doors you'll never see. When we were praying about when our kids were young, public, private, homeschool, and it was all that time in the, the culture wars were ramping up and put your kids in public school and they'll make little communists out of them and we're kind of all the way back to that again now. And we just said, God, what do you want? Sarah and I are both praying and we just felt like God said, I want you to put them in public schools and I want you to go with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does that mean? So we go down to the school saying, hey, we're, kids are going to be here for the next eight years in this elementary school. We want to come with them, so what can we do? And they did. They have an endless set of things you can do to help out, volunteer, parent volunteer stuff. So we volunteered. Because I did that, I got on a committee, and there was a problem with this uh, family life curriculum, sex ed, in the school. Christian parents were upset, and so I was there, and I kind of helped them. This is what the problem is, and this is probably a good way to fix it. And that got them all together, and we all agreed on a solution, and the school said, man, that was easy. Other schools over there being torn apart by this stuff, and so they said, How'd you guys get through this? And I just got this guy, Wayne, and it's like, can you come over here and help our school with a self-esteem curriculum? Like, okay, why not? So I go over there and do that. And then next thing, over years, this thing called Bridge Builder started. And I've been public consulting public school districts all over the United States and helping with some stuff in Washington, D.C. to deal with how do we have an environment in which everybody's conscience is respected. Wow. Christian, school, public schools can't be pro-Christian. They cannot. Mm -hmm. But they cannot be anti-Christian either. And if you're going to be a public school, no one should be asked to attend a public school that's biased against themselves. Wouldn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I help, I've helped them do that. I haven't done that recently. Uh, but that, that all came out of the book, The Language of Healing. So this little decision, when our daughter's five, ends up in this consulting, end up in a book now about the language of healing in a polarized nation. I don't think I see any of those up here. Yeah, I hid those things because you know, they just don't sell. You can't sell a book on peacemaking, they say, and they're right. You got to choose a villain and vilify them to make that work. But. So I, I love how just the simplest obediences into uncertainty open doors we can't see. You were talking about this whole thing happening. Just you, you, you didn't go out to build this, no. right? You just this decision led to that decision, led to that opportunity, led to this decision. Now we're here, and I, I think that's the way God works. In other words, His will unfolds in the dailiness of our following. I meet many young guys out of college or whatever, university or ministry school of some kind, and they've got a 10 year plan to get through youth ministry and to senior pastor and how they're gonna build their church and do all this, and they just look at them and say, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and well, I said, I had all that. None of that works. What you need to know is God's will will unfold as you follow. Uh, I think, like Brandon's question, he's been asking ever since he's come to Hope for Life, and so is his wife. And her question has been ever since. We're not willing to just stand there and see what's next. Yeah. Nobody's willing to do that. It's too scary. It's too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you speak up? Because we're in our will, not God's will. We want to be. 
And we think God's will means we have to go to Turkey and the kingdoms, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we have to suffer, blah, blah, blah. And it's not like that. It's I mean, not like that. What's his name um, who plays football? What's his name? Aaron Rodgers. He's not going to Africa and blah, 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 and starving. And Tim Tebow. Yeah. Oh. You know, it's like, but. Oh, that's no, But nobody's. <laughs> I think everybody needs to try to figure out what they need to do, and nobody's willing. We want a we want a formula. We want a formula guy. We want someone to tell us what microwave. to do. Huh? Hmm? Microwave. No, it's beyond microwave. It's like tell me what to do. No, mm -hmm. God wants to tell us what to do. Amen. And He wants us. And if we're gonna. Can you finish the thought? And He wants us. <laughs> I don't know, I get interrupted. <laughs> yeah, I know I have that problem too, and they do it to me too. <laughs> the, the greatest freedom God will give you is the joy of trusting Him day by day. Yeah. He knows that. And we think there's no joy in that, you see, because He's really mean, you know that, right? He's stingy, He's mean. He Doesn't that really test out. our perception of His love? Yeah. If we, if, okay, I'm going to put everything in you, and I'm going to follow you. And what he, I think Jesus, when he says each day has enough grace of its own, don't give any thought about tomorrow. What he's saying is, what, he's not saying give up control, right? Because that's what we, that's what it feels like. It feels like I'm going to give up control. What he's saying is give up the illusion of control. Yeah. You were never in control to start with. So everything you think you can control out there is an illusion. So your best shot at, at a fulfilled life is, what are you showing me today? I'll step into that. Are you showing me that? I'll step into that. And there's a lot of just occupying, just standing, and I don't know yet, so I don't have to do anything yet. There was a movie back there somewhere about the time Matrix came out called Instinct. Anthony Hopkins was in. He's a serial murderer, and he's got some psychologist, psychiatrist trying to help him process his pain so he won't kill more people. And he's given him the stupidest advice in the world, and he's trying to build rapport with him, so he has him unhandcuffed from the table, so he's sitting there in the middle of this conversation. Anthony Hopkins, who is the serial murderer, jumps across the table, grabs the counselor by the throat, holds him up in a chokehold, and says, what have I just taken from you? Remember this? And he's sitting there going, ah, oh, my freedom! And he chokes him tighter, going, no! What have I just taken from you? And he's his eyes all bugged out and said, ah, uh, my control. No! He ratchets him up even tighter. He says, what have I taken from you? And it's like, he's going to choke him to death right now if he can't get it. He says, my illusion. And he lets him go and he says, exactly. You are never in control. Freedom is not about getting what you want. That's not freedom. It's not demanding your rights. All the stuff going on in our world today is opposite the spirit of the kingdom. I'm going to demand my rights. I'm going to fight for this. I'm like, no, you're going to follow Jesus. Let his care for you unfold. Even if that means we go into the lion's den and, the, and get eaten by lions. Even if it's that, I'd rather unfold inside God's reality than have to live with my illusion that I can control my outcome. I can't. I can give you circumstances from my life right now that I never thought I would be in this situation with this person, but I am, and it's not my fault. But there's no way I could have mitigated against it. So it's not. So now I'm in it. And I'm going, you know what? My safest spot is to be inside him. My safest spot is not fixing this, not have seen it and heading it off. Because I've got my story, and the person I'm dealing with here has their story. And I don't control their story, and they don't control mine. So mine is best in the hands of Jesus. There will come a day on this journey when I promise you, I don't sit here thinking, I wish I could control my life, but Jesus asked me not to. If I stand here telling you I would rather have this day in his hands than my hands, because I will mess it up. If Jesus has a place for me to be six months from now, Wayne, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like to be here in your journey in six months. What am I going to try and do? Get there. And I won't get within 100 miles of it. If I follow him today, Following tomorrow, I follow in the next six months from now, I'm going to be exactly where he wants me to be doing it. We are our own worst advisors. We're our own worst critics. And I think this is, this is a big part of this journey right here. But 
I'm, this is a learning curve. Don't start with my freedom here if you're here. If this is just new to you, and I, man, I'm just learning to trust that he loves me. Live there. Don't pretend you trust him and make some really ridiculous choices. Don't try to give up control. Let Jesus' love win you out of the control you think you need. And don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> ask Jesus' love to win you out of the control you think you need. Because you don't have it. Anything could happen tomorrow, no matter what you do, no matter how much stuff you put in your barns to protect yourself. Anything can happen tomorrow. And I'm safest inside his reality. What he says is true. How he's orienting my heart to live in that space. Yes. And we'll see if someone else I'm gonna does. Take, I'm going to take a risk. And I want to ask you a tough one now. But I'm really curious. And, and I know you're not going to give me the answer, but I'm just going to... Okay. 21-year marriage that has not worked. And I get confused on what is it that I have to do. And he's here in the room, by the way, I think. But I'm taking a risk, like I said, because I don't come here to play. Uh, maybe I should. I do. I can make you play. Okay. So yeah. bottom line is, I know you cannot give the answer. I don't know if I'm staying because of my codependency and my fear of the unknown, what would be like without it, or what. So, like, how do you, I don't, I don't know, how do you handle that? And that's a bigger thing than whatever. Um, yeah, I would say I wouldn't make that decision in the current confusion of your heart. That's a big decision. So as long as I'm confused, you're saying I cannot make a decision? So good luck. That. That's not what I'm saying. No. <laughs> I'm saying I wouldn't make that decision today. I'd be leaning into the space where I'm starting to trust that Jesus can guide me. And that I'm going to follow his heart. I'm going to see what it seems to be on his mind to do. And I'm going to share that with a few of the people around here that I know. Oh, trust that. me, I have. Well, no, you haven't made a decision yet, right? No. Right. No, so but I'm saying... When you're ready to you're make You're saying when I, when I can do that little cycle perfectly... No. Is that what you're saying? No. You are misinterpreting almost everything I'm saying to you. Really. And you know that. So just I know. put it simple. That's all I'm saying. No, what I'm saying is there's so much confusion right now. The more the things I talk to you about over lunch, after lunch, mm -hmm. finding that rest, letting God teach you that. So in other words, if I never get to that rest place. Again, you're jumping to live conclusions. Live with it forever. You're jumping to conclusions. I'm not saying that. He will teach you to rest. You will know when the time comes for you to know. Right? To know what? That I'm resting? Or that no, I'm, what to, whether, to know? Whether, what to do? Whether I want to stay in this marriage or get out of it. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. 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 Well, there'll come a time when you'll know. But I don't think that's the most important thing going on for you right now. I think the most important thing is how do I rest from these voices in my head that are harassing me like demons, you know? So that I can't rest and process and talk to brothers and sisters I love and listen without arguing and struggling. That's the more important thing. Learn that, not perfectly, just learn a little bit of it. And in that space, God's gonna show you. And then when you think he shows you, share it with some people, say, I think I'm gonna do this. And if people around you say, yeah, sounds right to me. Or, yeah, are you sure? And then make your decision and live with it. God's okay with it, you can go either one. God's not gonna hate you either way. No, I know, but the, the anxiety doesn't come from making the decision, or the lack of anxiety doesn't come from that. The lack of anxiety comes from, he's got this. He's on my side. He's with me. Not to do my will, to do his. He knows the best way for you to navigate about anything we've got going. We can make decisions here in the weight of all the anger, anxiety and frustration. We just want to make a decision, get over with, and all, everything's going to be better. But it's not better when we make decisions now. So I'm saying, well, how do I kind of get some drafting up here? I told you I live about 10% up here and about 90% here. So that's not anything about perfection. That's just this breath of the Spirit here. There's life now. God, what seems good to you and good to the Holy Spirit. That's how the early church did it in Acts 15. This seems good to us and good to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that's about as much as you get. It seems good. We're seeing through a glass darkly. Let's give it a try and see how it works out. There's nothing... 
nothing, very few decisions we make that we can't go back on. For instance, you decide to leave a toxic, bad relationship, and which I recommend leaving toxic, bad relationships. I, if they're toxic and they're abusive, yeah, get out. But you can leave that. Something changes, repentance, God can bring it back together or something. This, no decision is usually final unless you take your own life or someone else's. That's a pretty big final decision. But you can make mistakes. God will be in there to keep inviting, directing. The bigger thing, again, is not whether you stay married or not. It's whether Jesus is getting to liberate you into his life and freedom. And his glory then gets reflected through you to the world. Yeah, makes sense? That's well, not perfect, man. It's never perfect. Yeah. Come back. Oh, Mike, good. The Mike man. Call me Mike. Hey, Mike. Hi. Hi, Angela. I was talking to you outside. Um, I missed uh, like the morning session, but I am still reading this, and I really like it. Um, I like the part on fear and anxiety because that's where I am. Mm -hmm. Weeks I have, I've had like for most of my life, fear and anxiety. I have panic attacks, so I was like, um, you know, trying to find out like why. And I've been to church most of my life, so I know that Bible verse like. Um, his perfect love casts out fear. And I've even spoke to many pastors, you know, can you cast out a spirit of fear? And they're like, no, 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 his perfect love casts out fear. So I'm just thinking like, you know, if I feel loved, and if I, if I can really feel his love, I think my anxiety is gonna go away. And like, I remember this week, I was trying to even tell myself like, God is for me, not against me. Because I do feel that he is rejecting me or that he doesn't like me a lot. You know, it's like what goes in behind my head. So I kind of need to talk myself. And I don't know, I guess I'm just learning to accept his love. I think that's right. Welcome. Yeah. That's a, and we've all been through this, right? We said this morning, some of this early processing of this is three, four, five year journey. This is not easy to just, oh, I'm not loved and I'm just going to live loved and it's that simple. But yes, the more you live in his love, the more your anxieties and fears will recede. Won't be an on-off switch, won't go. The problem with religionists trying to help us here, religion exists on fear. That's how religion works. It starts with the fear of hell, then it's the fear of missing out on God's blessing, and then it's the fear of God's punishment. It's, it's all fear-based. And the life of the new covenant is not fear-based at all. It's love-based. How, that, that love will change us far more than fear ever will, but religious institutional people find fear a very effective tool to manipulate people. And that's why when things happen in the world, it is easy to motivate a lot of Christians on the basis of fear. And somebody's promising to fix all that for them, and so they're in with it until that doesn't work either. Because we're, we're schooled in it. So the first part of this journey definitely is Jesus inviting us out of all those fears that those of us who grew up in religion have got wired down in here in ways we can't even see. We see some of it on the surface, but it's deep. And that perfect love casts out fear. I hear pastors mitigate that all the time. I mean, you know, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You got to have a little bit of fear of this. Then they go, no, 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 no. The new covenant says once you love God, and learn to live in his love, you will never need to fear him again. Nor will you need to fear missing out. God's going to make sure you get everything he wants you to have and everything that's good for you, even though it means, no, circumstances don't work out the way I want. There's still pain in our lives. There's still people around us causing trouble. We cause some of our own trouble. So it's not a perfect life where God, you won't fear because nothing bad will ever happen to you again. That's what a lot of people thought. You know, I'm, the affliction will never come nigh the dwelling of the righteous. Well, then you get sick or someone you love dies. Or, you know, I know someone this pandemic started, there was some talk of just, you know, Christians will be immune from this because Psalm 91, whatever we were quoting, that the pestilence will not come near you. So the books above, we claim that. And that's going to make it happen. And one of the most, one of my closest friends who's been a complete advocate to do nothing about COVID and it will not come near her tan, claiming all these scriptures, died last weekend while I was here of COVID. Oh my goodness. So when we start quoting scriptures to try and shape the life, we think we're on the wrong path. We're just off. Your biggest place of safety 
even at your most sinful or broken, is on the lap of the Father who loves you more than anyone on this planet ever has or who will. You are safer in Him than anything else you can think to do, any way you want to manipulate people around you or circumstance to get your goals. You're, but knowing that, it's, it's easy to agree with me saying that. Oh, that sounds so true. Knowing that intuitively. I don't mean even feeling it, because feelings lead us astray, right? Mm. Yeah. Intellect can lead us astray, right? Mm. Intellect can help us. Feelings can help us. They can also lead us astray. What we really need is our heart to be reinvigorated by the regeneration of our redemption in Christ Jesus. So this, and I don't mean the physical organ of my heart, but there's that center of who we are that listens to God. That's bigger than our mind or our feelings. God often uses our mind and feelings, no problem. But there's something deeper in there, and people didn't teach us to follow our heart. It taught us to follow the leader who was interpreting a book who was telling us what we should do. And I think all of this is just saying, look, let's learn to follow our hearts. You have a, you have a shepherd who wants to, I, I talk to a lot of pastors who talk about the important role they play in leadership and guiding the sheep and blah, blah. No, no, no. Somewhere we'll get to Ezekiel 34, the worthless shepherds. You haven't read them a while ago, read it, man. Just these worthless shepherds, they do this, they feed themselves off the fat of the land, they tromp down the muddy water so the young sheep can't feed, and it's just, it's just ugly. And I've, I've heard it taught at many pastor seminars. These are the worthless shepherds. We can't be like the worthless shepherds. We got to be the opposite of the of the bad shepherds. And I always, always say, okay, is that the what's the fix in this passage? Is the fix God's going to take away the bad shepherds and give us better ones? Is that the fix? And, and they all say yes, because that's how they've heard it. I say, keep reading. And I'll sit there with them sometimes. Just keep reading until it finally says, and I will remove the worthless shepherds. And I will be their shepherd. Uh -huh. I will send them my servant David, which is talking about Jesus. He will shepherd them. And he will lead them into safe pastures so that they will never need to fear again. And he will lead us to the quiet waters. That's what Jesus, doggone that's real right now. Do you, you sense that? Yeah. He's just right here to say, yeah, I always want to be your shepherd. I didn't want to give you to somebody else. A good, quote unquote, leader in the church, a shepherd, it's going to help equip you to follow Jesus, not supplant Jesus by telling you what to do. That's what leaders are. I don't know if I shared this last time I was with you. It's in Finding Church. A friend of mine in Australia did the research. And I want to hear this because this, is, this helps you if you're a pastor or a counselor or whatever you are. Prior to Ignatius, Ignatius was an early church father. He was John's disciple. John, they had that John, the one laying on Jesus' chest. Second generation. Ignatius, one generation removed from Paul. Ignatius, as he learns about the life of Jesus, Ignatius is in the time past the Testament, now past the New Testament being written, where we're institutionalizing what we call church. He becomes the bishop of Carthage or Alexandria. I'm not sure I remember which one. If anybody knows, you can tell us. But he became a bishop. And now we're institutionalizing. So we need people to cooperate with the bishop. Prior to this time at Ignatius, back here, the early church saw an elder slash counselor slash pastor slash whatever as a guardian of a gift. What's the gift? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Not Christ in me. Not Christ in your favorite author. Not Christ in your favorite institution. Christ, when you receive him and he is in you, your hope of glory that's glory right here. Your hope of that is in him. It's not in finding the right book. It's not in finding the right sermon to belong to, the right leader to follow, the right, 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 nothing. It's in him, in him alone. And the elders saw themselves as guardians of a gift. You have this gift. And don't mind if someone tries to take that gift from you by telling you what to do. If I'm an elder around you, I'm going to step between you and him and say, would you please leave this poor girl alone? <laughs> If you have something to share with her, share it with her. Don't tell her what to do, because that's not your job. The gift of Christ is in her. You want to help her? Encourage that gift. And if anybody's going to intrude on it, I'm going to intrude on them. Say, you don't need to do that. Nobody starts giving her rules instead of encouraging her to follow Jesus as he makes himself known in her. I'm going to stop them. Right? After Ignatius got to be the bishop of whatever, they redefined eldership. 
Eldership's not guardian of a gift anymore. Eldership is guardian of right faith and practice. We'll go through the book at our seminaries. And we'll decide what are the important things we need to live and do. And we can't even agree on that, which is why we have 60,000 some odd denominations and new ones forming every day. But we'll interpret the book. We'll tell you how to live. And now we're going to be guardians of right faith and practice. So you need to have sound doctrine. And we'll decide what that is. And we'll reward you when you follow what we say. We'll talk nice about you and let you be on the stage and do wonderful things because you're, and when you don't, we'll cut you off at the legs, right? So we went from being guardians of a gift, encouraging Jesus to come alive in people, to being guardians of right faith and practice, which is just being policemen in the body of Christ, or policewomen. We're telling people what to do, rewarding them when they get it right, punishing them when they get it wrong, and we, we lost this connection with the shepherd, because Jesus said, John 10, he completes what Ezekiel 34 says about, I will shepherd my own people. And now he comes and says, I am the good shepherd. And a stranger, they will not follow. My sheep know my voice, and they'll listen, and they'll follow me. And a stranger, they will not follow. So Jesus completes that. That's what it's always meant to be in this kingdom. Jesus is your shepherd. He's your pastor. He's your leader. People who love you will encourage you to follow him, not supplant it. Where people supplant it, back away. Make sense? What is supplant it? Take his place. Even using scripture to take Jesus' place in your heart. When you're following anything other than him. Now, I, I told you, I think this book teaches us how to follow him. I love this book. I know some of you. Sorry? Okay, okay good. <laughs> Just play. Yeah, ma'am. So my, when you feel, basically like when my boss calls me, she's always on like 100, you know, like anxious and stuff. And I'm trying to live in my peace, you know? <laughs> and so how do you prevent, how do you stop from taking on other people's anxiety? Because I feel like I don't so much struggle with anxiety, but I struggle with other people's anxiety when they're around me. Mm. So how do you like keep your peace, still get the job done, you know, but not take on their anxiety? Yeah, this will be the last question because I, I think we're almost done. I want to say some things, you perhaps say some things, so we'll be done. So let me, let me do this last and then if you want to talk to me individually, talk to me tomorrow, whatever, we'll be able to still have time to do that. But I don't take on anybody's anything. Fear, anxiety, and I used to. So. And I say, well, here's how I don't do that. I don't know how I don't do it. I just don't do it anymore. It comes at me, and I listen. And if there's something from that I'm supposed to do, I do. If I'm working for somebody, which I do with bridge builders or some other things, I, you're coming at me all frantic, upset, whatever, fine. I'm just trying to hear what it is that you need from me. And then when you're gone, I, I, don't, feel, I don't take on. I just don't take it. And I think that's a Jesus gift. I think he helps us unpack whatever that does. So I'd ask him, I'd say, what is it in here that revs up when I hear from my boss? And instead of just going, yeah, okay. That's right. Okay, great. I'll take care of that for you. And then she goes on, rabbit, 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 or he, and they just go, okay, okay. And then just hang up and go do what it is that you need to do and just don't take it on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good by me. Okay. Yeah, and if it's, you know. Yeah. But I still do it. Wayne? Yeah. I think sometimes, yeah. I, and I think you're able to do that because it's not triggering anything inside of you. Yeah, that's, a, that's my point. Yeah. It's the freedom here. So when somebody yanks on my wire, it's not knotted to anything. So it's, it, I don't have to lay it down. It's just not there. I didn't take it in. And I hope what you've heard me say, and we talk about more of this tomorrow, don't live inside my freedom. Don't live inside your friend's freedom. Don't live inside of Lackey's freedom. Live inside of your freedom. Your own freedom. Yep. This is where I am in Jesus. So that really ticks me off, or that gets me all psyched up. So now I'm backing in saying, Jesus, I want help here. Because yep. I don't want that person spiraling me up in their fear, their anger, their approval needs. And you can go on and on with the things that people want to unload on us. Anger, violence, lies. They just want to unload. They want people to... They want to control people around them. And I think part of living loved is, you know, longer there's nothing to control there. Like people say, I'm going to tell so-and-so you did such and such. Go ahead. Who cares? Well, people, 
they believe it. They, that's part of their journey. It's not my journey. I'm not your victim. I'm just not. But that is, I like that point. That's a, that's a place of freedom. So hunger for it. If you're not there, go ahead and hunger for it. Don't condemn it. I should be there by now. No, no you can't get there until you're there. <laughs> this is all very real stuff. This is not just how we're going to pretend. That's what, yeah. that's what sermons always were. Here's what you need to pretend is true. I hope you haven't heard any of that from me today. I'm trying to describe a reality. You can be just on the very front door of this. Enjoy that. There's lots to learn and experience there. You may be finding yourself in a greater freedom here. And enjoy that. Don't be in a hurry. Don't boss Jesus around because it just doesn't work. I've tried most of my life, as I said, to get Jesus on my agenda. My prayer list used to be, do this, Jesus, do this, give me that, kill that, do this. I, he never answered that stuff, maybe 1% of it. Can you most change, of, change my boss's heart? Yes. Yes. We always pray for somebody else's change. Yes, we do. Yeah. We never pray for our own change. change my spouse's heart. Change, change my children's heart. We're asking. And instead of now, I just wake up every morning and my prayer is, what are you doing in me today? What do you want me to know? What are you giving me to love? I've got people I love, like my wife, Sarah, like my children, like other people in my family. I just hold them and say, God, love Sarah today. Fill her with good things. Show her what you have in mind for her today. My daughter, Julie, my son, Andrew, my son-in-law. I just hold them before God. I don't do it every morning. I don't have time every morning. But when, I, when they're on my heart, I do. When I'm driving, I do. But most of my prayers are simply, God, what are you doing here? This is my perspective. Even my best religious perspective. I'm trying to see what's going on here. And, I, and then I make decisions that don't never turn out well. This is Jesus, what are you saying? And if I don't know, I don't know. But when I start to know what he sees, now I start to live in that differently. And this is all in part through a glass door. It's never perfect. Don't go for perfection. You'll kill yourself. <laughs> and you'll kill people around you. It's just not good. Just live in what light shines in your life today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you today for having me with you. Thank you. And now you see you kicked off the dog, see? <laughs> this, that was not an applause line. I genuinely appreciate the invitation. Gigi, I appreciate your help the last few weeks with this chart so much. And I guess we're going to play with it some more still. If you're, if you're game. Yes. I want you to look at me. Let her eyes meet. Just look at me. I see your eyes. Jesus loves you more than you've ever been loved by anyone on the planet. He knows everything in your life that's screwed up, everything you've tried to hide, everything that you treasure and enjoy. He sees it all. He has all the keys to sort out in you what will let you live free and full and delighted in his love. And all he needs from you is a willing heart. That's all he needs. Just, God, please do this in me. I want you to do this. In me. That's all he needs. Now, that way you'll know his goodness, his graciousness. May you know it today, this evening, as you go home. May the peace of God go with you. May the love of God consume you. May the resting in his labor set your heart at peace in his goodness. May you know him more today than you did yesterday. And may we know him more tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Amen. And to present you before his glorious throne without fault and great joy. Did you hear any of you in that? Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. To present you before the throne without fault and with great joy. Amen. To him be glory in the church both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, guys.
I, I, I think this is wonderful. I mean, thank you. Um, I just think it's great to our Zoom family. Thank you for all of you that stick around and, and I know it's hard doing it on Zoom, sitting there, watching it, all the distractions, but thank you everyone for being